Welcome to Introduction to S Corporations and LLCs, Part 1. This is a two-part class. We really do intend that the class be taken in its entirety, Part 1 followed by Part 2. There's nothing to prevent a person from doing only one or the other, but today's class is laying the foundation for the class that we will hold on Thursday, which is Part 2. My name is April Gutierrez. I am your instructor for today's class and pretty much all the classes here at Pacific Northwest Tax School. I wrote this course out of necessity. S corporations are a fairly common small business entity type and we do lots of them in our own practice and I was getting a lot of requests from students for more classes that would cover S corporations and so I created this course and over the years it's really uh, rounded out to the point where it is at now. There's been very few updates to the class this year because not much has changed from last year, but it, this course I've been teaching it for over a decade and just refining it as I go each year. And we're going to really, in today's class, start at the very, very, very beginning. We're assuming that you have some understanding of tax law. In other words, you understand what it is to um, have a profit and loss for a business, the types of income and types of expense items that uh, are common to businesses, so we're assuming you have that kind of a background, but beyond that, we're, we're assuming you know very little about uh, preparation of Form 1065 or Form 1120S, or if you know somewhat about it but you're not real clear on it, we're basically going to be taking you from the very beginning today. So we're going to start with a description of the various entity types. And if you flip in the manual to page four, you'll be where I'm at now. And business entity types are important because depending on the type of entity you are, that's really going to dictate how the IRS taxes you. So we're going to talk about the different entity types, how they're formed, how they're changed, how they end, and uh, then we'll move on to a discussion of how each of these entity types is taxed. Then we're going to move on to a closer in-depth look at the preparation of Form 1065. And the reason we're going to be looking at 1065 is that most limited liability companies are going to default to Form 1065 unless action is taken to become an S corporation or make that S corporation taxation election. So we're going to look first at the default form of how a limited liability company is taxed and then we're going to go to the next level in part two of this course where we look at how S corporations are taxed and how to prepare Form 1120S. So beginning up at the top of page, page four with business entity types, there are a number of different organizational structures that are available to business owners, and each type of business structure has its advantages and disadvantages. One of the key things that I say to my clients is there's no one best entity type. It really depends on your business and your ability to manage your business, the size of your business, who else you're working with, that's going to determine what is the best entity type for you. And it could be easy to just make this general blanket statement, oh, S corporations are the best. Everyone should be an S corporation. But that would not be true. Everyone shouldn't be an S corporation. And is it really necessary to form an LLC? Does everyone have to have an LLC because they're in business? Some of these are getting into legal questions that are best left in the hands of attorneys. But when it comes to the actual preparation of a tax return, I find things are a little bit clearer. What decisions should you make for taxes? can be clearer than what decision should you make for liability protection, say. But let's look first at the different types of entity types that are out there. We have the sole proprietor, which is typically a business that is owned by one person. There's also a general partnership that is owned by two or more entities. It could be persons or entities other than persons. Or a separate legal entity that operates as a corporation, a limited liability company, a limited liability partnership, or a limited partnership. The sole proprietorship is the simplest form of business. And if you're working as a tax preparer and you've had no education in S corporations up until now, odds are that you've, your experience with pre preparation of business returns is going to be limited to Schedule C. With the Schedule C, you have an individual person who conducts business in his or her name or under an assumed business name. And unless the business owner files articles of incorporation with the Secretary of State's office in his or her state, his or her business is going to be automatically classified as a sole proprietorship. The very act of operating a for-profit business turns you into sole proprietorship unless you're a partnership, right? So you don't have to do anything other than just decide to engage in an activity with a profit motive. The sole proprietorship is a simple and informal structure that is inexpensive to form. 
In fact, it's so inexpensive to form, you can have one when you don't even know it. It is usually owned by a single person or a marital community, and the sole proprietor business owner is personally liable for the obligations of the business, except in certain situations where he or she has filed or articles of organization with the Secretary of State's office to form a limited liability company. A sole proprietor can freely transfer all or part of the business and reports business profit or loss on a personal income tax return by filing Schedule C or F. F would, of course, be if they're a farmer. Let's talk now about an assumed business name. Because generally, a sole proprietor does not have to be registered with his or her state's business registry unless he or she is using an assumed business name. If the name of the business does not include the full legal name of the business owner, the business name must generally be registered as an assumed business name with the business registry of the state in which that proprietor is operating his or her business. The registration allows the public to identify who is transacting business under that business name. So let's just suppose we've got April Gutierrez. I'm an enrolled agent. If I decide to do business as April Gutierrez, enrolled agent, <laughs> uh, there's nothing I need to do to register that business name. I, EA is merely my title and April Gutierrez is my name, so I, I'm really good to go. But if I want to run a business that's called April 15th Tax Service, say, and there was a tax service here in Portland called April 15th Tax Service for a while. Many years ago, they're gone now, but April 15th Tax Service. That might be a cute name, it might be relevant to my name, but it obviously isn't my name and there's no way for people to really correlate April 15 tax service with April Gutierrez. And so as such, I would need to register that business name with the state. Am I allowed to do so? Well, that would depend on whether anyone else has already registered that name and where they've registered that name. If it's established that that business name is available, then I can register it. The importance of registering that name is that if someone wants to know who's doing business as April 15th tax service, they're going to be able to go to the business registry for the state and establish who that business owner is. So uh, anonymity, I guess you could say, is what is being avoided with this registration of business names. Uh, the government doesn't want people to be able to just operate businesses anonymously. They want to be able to hold people accountable. So how do you go about registering a business name? Well, to check a name for availability prior to submitting an application, which is a good idea, you may check the website of the appropriate Secretary of State office for the state in which you want to register your business. The specifics of business name registration are going to vary by state, and a name availability check does not guarantee that the name will still be available when that state's business registry receives the application. Now, things have gotten a lot simpler. I've been around long enough that I remember when there was no internet and that if you wanted to register a business name, the starting point was to call up the Secretary of State on the phone, up, up that office, speak to someone over the phone, uh, you know, offer up some proposed names, and they would let you know if that name ha was available. And then you could fill out a manual form, submit a fee, and register your business. Uh, with the internet, things are much easier. I mean, you really can these days go onto the internet, do a search for business names, see if anything pops up, see if anything is similar or different enough, and then fill out an online application pretty much on the spot and get your business registered. So it's much, much easier these days to do that. Now, how do you do it in your state? Well, you're just going to have to figure that out. Here in Oregon, we have a website called filinginoregon.com, and it makes it super simple to Determine if a business name is available. You can also use it to search who owns business names, who's the registered agent of a business name, the type of business that has been registered under a name. Is it a, is it a corporation? Is it a limited liability company? Is it a DBA? Uh, all of those things can be determined very readily uh, in, in just a couple of minutes over the Internet. So I'm sure that your state has something similar to filinginoregon.com, and it wouldn't hurt to just on your own time go and explore that and figure out how it all works. The next item we're going to talk about is the general partnership. Partnerships are a little bit like uh, sole proprietorships in that they automatically happen, even though the business owners may not intentionally have been creating them. Because a partnership is automatically formed when two or more persons or business entities agree to jointly own and operate a business. Profit, loss, and managerial duties are shared among the partners, and each partner is personally liable for the partnership debts. Partnerships are an inexpensive to form, and a formal organizational agreement is not required. It's simply enough to shake hands. Let's go do this together. Let's buy this car and fix it up together and sell it. 
that would be a you know it could be it could be deemed to be a hobby but if the uh, uh, object of purchasing that car fixing it up and selling it was to make a profit then you probably just created a partnership and maybe it wasn't quite intentional now partnerships do not pay income taxes directly however an informational return form 1065 must be filed to report business income and expenses of the partnership and individual partners report their share of profits and losses on their personal return a joint undertaking merely, though, to share expenses is not a partnership. Mere co-ownership of property that is maintained and leased or rented is not a partnership. However, if the co-owners provide services to the tenants, a partnership exists. So what this is saying is that if you and another person agree to purchase a vacant lot together for investment purposes, that is not creating a partnership, just the mere co-ownership of it. And it even goes to one step further and say if you and another individual decide to purchase a rental property and each of you own 50-50 and it's done as a passive activity, odds are you don't have a partnership there either. You can just each report your individual share of income and expenses. But there are certain actions that can occur that would turn what would otherwise not be a partnership into a partnership. We're going to now look at uh, what makes a partnership work, who comprises the partnership. And a first item we're going to look at is a general partner. A general partner is a partner who is personally liable for the partnership debt. A general partnership is composed only of general partners. A limited partner is a partner in a partnership under, formed under state limited partnership laws whose personal liability for partnership debts is limited to the amount of money or other property that the partner is required to contribute to the partnership. And a limited partnership is formed under state limited partnership laws and is composed of at least one general partner and one or more limited partners. We then have a limited liability partnership. And a limited liability partnership, or LLP, is formed under state limited liability partnership laws. And generally, a partner in an LLP is not personally liable for the debts of the LLP or any other partner nor is a partner liable for the acts or omissions of any other partner solely by reason of being a partner. Now, one of the things to be aware of with these LLPs is that the shape and nature of an LLP is really going to vary by state. I can't give you a blanket terminology of all the rules that apply to an LLP because those are really set at the state level at which that LLP is formed, and they do vary by state. Non-recourse loans are those liabilities of a partnership for which no partner bears economic risk of loss. Let's talk now about a qualified joint venture, or QJV. Under the default rules, a business that is owned by two or more individuals is automatically classified as a partnership. And this is true even if the owners of the partnership are spouses who file a joint return. Since 2007, the IRS rules have permitted a married couple to elect to file as a qualified joint venture rather than as a partnership. A QJV is a joint venture that conducts a trader business where the only members of that joint venture are a married couple who file a joint return, both spouses materially participate in the trader business, and both spouses elect not to be treated as a partnership. A QJV includes only businesses that are owned and operated by the spouses as co-owners and not in the name of a state law entity, including a limited partnership or an LLC. But there is an exception to this rule if the spouses reside in a community property state. And I just wanted to point out here, there's a little asterisk up here, and it says, note that the instructions for Form 1065 have replaced the phrase husband and wife with either a married couple or spouses and you should refer to the following URL for more information on that. You can also learn more about qualified joint ventures by visiting this URL where the IRS talks more about qualified joint ventures. So let's continue on though with a little bit more on qualified joint ventures. They're a rather interesting concept because remember when two individuals agree to go into a profit-making venture together, a business venture together, they automatically form a partnership. And IRS says it doesn't matter if they're married or even filing a joint return. The partnership really is a default mechanism. You've got two individuals who've gone into business together. But there is a relatively new rule that the IRS says, even though we consider you to be a partnership, we're going to allow you to avoid filing Form 1065, so long as you are married and filing a joint return. And instead of filing Form 1065, you can file two Schedule Cs with your individual return. 
So what would be the motive for avoiding the 1065 and filing two Schedule Cs instead? And the answer is just because then you don't have to do a 1065. You could say that there's more complexity to the 1065. It's a more difficult tax return to complete. It might be that a husband and wife who are in business together might be able to prepare their own Schedule Cs, but going over to the 1065 is more complex. So that would be my guess for the motives that IRS has in allowing a qualified joint venture. So how do you go about making this qualified joint venture? Well, spouses electing QJV status are treated as sole proprietors for federal tax purposes. The spouses must share the business's items of income, gain, loss, deduction, and credit. And under these reporting procedures, the spouses must take into account the items in accordance with each spouse's interest in the business as follows. Each spouse must file a separate Schedule C or Schedule F to report profits and losses, and if otherwise required, a separate Schedule SC to report self-employment tax for each spouse. Spouses with a re rental real estate business can now be reported on Schedule E by checking the QJV box on line two, and you should refer to the Schedule E instructions for pages E1 and E2 on that particular topic. If the election is made for a farm rental business, that is not included in self-employment, you would file two forms 4835 instead of a Schedule F. And here is an illustration of how a QJV would report income and expenses on a tax return. Lucy and Ricky are a married couple. Lucy and Ricky own and operate a business called Lucy's Boutique. In 2010, they made an election to file as a qualified joint venture. As a qualified joint venture, they report the income and expenses of Lucy's Boutique on their jointly filed Form 1040 return by dividing income and expenses between the two Schedule Cs. Lucy reports her share of income and expenses on her Schedule C, and Ricky reports his share of income and expenses on his Schedule C. Limited liability company is the next item we're going to be looking at. So we've studied uh, the concept of a sole proprietor, a partnership, a qualified joint venture, now we're moving on to something else again, the limited liability company. A limited liability company is an entity or association that is formed under state law by filing articles of organization as an LLC. Unlike a partnership, none of the members of the LLC are personally liable for its debts. I was a little bit interested in uh, an LLC, the LLC and where they came from. I've been doing taxes since the early 1990s. And I can remember in those early years, people were coming in and saying they'd formed LLCs. And I would go to QuickFinder and open it up. And QuickFinder would say, OK, LLCs file a partnership return. And I go, hot dog, and prepare a, a partnership return. But it wasn't always possible to file a partnership return because in order to have a partnership, you have to have two or more members. And, and so this was a topic of discussion and I look back on it and how silly and ignorant I was back then but the reality is most people were trying to figure out LLCs at that time. So actually this morning as I was preparing for a class I thought okay well I keep reading these things that say that the limited liability company is a relatively new business structure and I certainly know back in the mid 90s it seemed really new and the the reason for that is that the, according to Wikipedia the very earliest limited liability company was formed back in 1977, and it was in one state only. And then subsequent to that, another state came up with it. And sometime around the early 90s, there seemed to be a uniformity where most states were now allowing limited liability companies, and there was confusion. And then sometime in the mid-90s is when the IRS really started to create regulations to help guide the principles behind LLCs. So when we talk about an LLC being a, a new type of business structure, it really is new, uh, only in the last 20 years or so. And we compare that to corporations. Now, one of the corporations I remember very vividly, or <laughs> think about in terms of age, is the Hudson's Bay Company. And it's because I'm Canadian, the Hudson's Bay Company owns the Bay. And uh, the Bay is everywhere in Canada. You go shopping, there's always going to be a Bay department store somewhere. Like Macy's here, we have the Bay in Canada. But the Bay is really old. The Hudson's Bay Company was formed back in 1670. <laughs> so it's, a, it's over 300 years old. And I can remember my father worked for the Bay when I was a little girl, and he came home with some balloons because they were celebrating their 300th birthday. So we compare the concept of a corporation, which is centuries old, with these new limited liability rules. That's why people are still figuring LLCs out. There just isn't the case history or the case history that we have is much, much more recent. So back to the top here, limited liability company. 
in order to be an LLC, you have to obviously make a decision to be an LLC, and then you file articles of organization to form that LLC, and you file those articles with the state that you're doing business in or that you want to do business in, typically. But you don't have to do it. You can actually file articles of uh, organization with any state and do business in another state. That is possible, uh, and it is done. But typically, uh, when I see LLCs formed, they're wanting to do business in their home state, and that's where they form them. Now, unlike a partnership, none of the members of an LLC are personally liable for its debts. So what does that sentence mean? Well, when you form a partnership, this is a pretty interesting concept. And I can remember in the very basic, basic classes I was taking in college uh, like 30 years ago, there was this concept that, if, uh, that we were told that if you form a partnership with someone, handshake partnership to do business together, and one partner goes off and makes a deal with a vendor, you're automatically liable for that. Um, so that's a pretty risky thing to just form a, a general partnership like that. You can be held liable for all of the partnership's debts. Even if you didn't agree to be a part of that debt, you're automatically going to be liable for it. So that is a key reason why an LLC is going to be an attractive entity type for people who want to go into business together because it's going to help protect them from personal liability for the business's debt. The LLC can be operated by managers or members, and managers can be, but are not required to be, members. It must be stated in the Articles of Organization if the LLC is to be managed by a manager. The LLC is a relatively new business structure, as I have been explaining, and it is allowed by state statute. LLCs are popular because they offer a sort of hybrid business type which combines certain features of both corporations and partnerships. An LLC may be classified for federal income tax purposes as a partnership, a corporation, or, this is a confusing one for a lot of people, an entity disregarded as an entity separate from its owner by applying rules in the regulation section 301.7701-3. So what that is saying, this sentence is, you've formed an entity, but we're, we're going to pretend that entity doesn't exist. In other words, we're not going to recognize the entity as being separate from you. All we do is see you. So IRS says that an LLC, when it is formed, is either going to be formed as a partnership, or it could be taxed as a corporation, or it's neither of those things because it's a disregarded entity. And in, in, in the case of a disregarded entity, IRS doesn't even recognize that any entity was formed. It's just going to look strictly at the owner. You should note that a domestic LLC with at least two members that does not file Form 8832 is classified as a partnership for federal income tax purposes. So let's look at how the LLC has similarities to a corporation and also to a partnership. So corporate similarity first. An LLC is similar to a corporation in that the owners have limited personal liability for the debts and actions of the LLC. Partnership similarity, operationally, LLCs are more like a partnership because they allow management flexibility and the benefit of pass-through taxation. Owners of an LLC are called members. As a member, your liability for LLC debts is limited by state law. However, you may be held personally liable in situations involving unpaid employee withholdings if you are found to be the person who is responsible for making the payment. In other words, IRS says whoever is, is the person or persons in a business charged with making sure that payroll withholdings actually make it to the Treasury, you're not going to use the LLC to escape that obligation. So if you've been paying employees, you've been withholding taxes from their pay, you've been uh, supposedly filing the 941 reports as you were required to do so, and then you don't send that money onto the Treasury as you are supposed to, don't expect the LLC to protect you because it won't. <laughs> So who can own an LLC? Most states do not restrict LLC ownership. Therefore, members may include individuals, corporations, other limited liability companies, and foreign entities. Also, there is no maximum number of members. Most states also permit single-member LLCs, which have only one owner. A few types of businesses generally cannot be LLCs, though, and these include banks, insurance companies, and nonprofit organizations. So what are the advantages of an LLC? Well, the LLC is generally considered to be advantageous for small businesses because it combines the limited personal liability benefit of a corporation with the tax advantages of a partnership and sole proprietorship. Profits and losses can be passed through to the company or passed through the company to its members, or the LLC can elect to be taxed as a corporation. LLCs do not have stock and are not required to observe corporate formalities. 
The owners are called members, and the LLC is managed by these members or by appointed managers. So are there disadvantages to LLCs? Well, yeah, there are some disadvantages. Well, LLCs continue to be a popular business model, and they are often preferred by attorneys who recommend them to individuals who are starting up new businesses. There are certain disadvantages to be aware of, including... LLC managers must pay taxes on their distributive share of the profits of the company, even if they have not received a distribution of those profits. By comparison, the owners of a C corporation do not pay taxes on profits unless they are distributed, usually in the form of dividends. So let's just think about this a minute. You are an owner of a stock in a C corporation. I'm just going to pick a company out there. I went to Disneyland recently, so let's make it Disney. You own Disney stock. And the Disney stock over time goes up in value. It also, in a good year, for hopefully most good years are good years, is going to be issuing dividends to the shareholders. But the dividends that are issued to the shareholders are the only form of income that that shareholder ever needs to recognize. Disney itself could be highly profitable, file a corporate tax return, pay taxes on its corporate profits, and not distribute any of those profits to its shareholders in theory. There's going to be rules that prescribe when and how much they do need to distribute. But let's just suppose Disney filed a return and decided not to do any corporate distributions that year. The shareholders would not be on the hook for reporting any kind of income from Disney stock because they didn't receive any distributions. But with an LLC, things are very different. If we take a business entity and say, instead of being a corporation, now you're an LLC, that LLC can turn a profit. And the LLC, if it is not made a corporate election, is going to be taxed typically as a partnership. And if that LLC makes a decision not to distribute any income to its members, those members are going to have to pay tax on money they have not received. So that can be a distinct disadvantage. And I have a client, <clears throat> this wasn't happening with an LLC, it was actually happening with, or not with a partnership, but it was happening with an S corporation and they're very similar where every year he was getting this phantom income off of <laughs> the entity. He's getting a K-1 every year showing his distributive share of income from the business, but he wasn't ever actually being given any of that income. And so every year he was having to report and pay tax on money he didn't receive. So LLC owners must pay taxes on their distributive share of the profit of the company, even if they have not received a distribution of those profits. And this contrasts with the corporation where with a C corporation, you pay tax only if you actually receive a dividend. LLC owners who perform services for the LLC must pay self-employment taxes, including Social Security and Medicare tax, on all income and profits unless the LLC elects to be taxed as a corporation. And for a single-member LLC, the formation of an LLC may impose certain filing requirements at the state level. Minimum registration fees and or taxes can be imposed on the LLC that would not be imposed on a sole proprietorship. And here's an example of what I mean. And I can't really say that this is in every state. I just know that this is a, a thing that is very specific to California. The state of California imposes a mandatory filing requirement on all LLCs registered or conducting business within the state of California. The minimum annual filing fee of $800 must be paid whether or not the business had California income for the year. Thus, a sole proprietorship operating in California may benefit by not forming an LLC because the non-LLC sole proprietorship is not subject to that minimum $800 tax. So if you've got a client in California who's operating their own little business, and it's not much of a business, Forming an LLC might be a very, very expensive decision. Not only are they going to have to file the articles of organization and renew those each year with California be paying those minimum fees every year, but on top of that, they're going to have to file an LLC return. California doesn't accept a Schedule C for a single-member LLC. It requires a specific LLC return be filed, and then it wants that minimum $800 fee every year. So that would be another disadvantage. Another disadvantage, LLC organizational structure. An LLC operates in a manner similar to a corporation. However, the controlling parties have different titles as follows. LLC managers can be compared to the board of directors of a corporation, and LLC members can be compared to the shareholders of a corporation. In order to be a member of an LLC, a contribution such as cash, property, or services rendered must be made. Next up, we have the operating agreement, and the internal affairs of the LLC are governed by operating agreements, which may be oral or written. 
These operating agreements are comparable to the bylaws of a corporation, and the internal affairs are managed by the members, unless the articles of organization specifically state that they shall be managed by one or more managers. Now, it isn't necessary for every LLC to have an operating agreement. Many don't. In Oregon, for example, you go to filinginoregon.com, and you file articles of organization with the Secretary of State here in Oregon, and you're done. You're an LLC. There's no requirement that you actually go and form an operating agreement. But an operating agreement is a pretty good idea, especially if you've got more than one owner in that business because that is really the agreement between the owners on how they're going to run that business. And any type of decision made by two or more people on how to run a business should really be in writing. And the operating agreement is typically where an attorney is going to come into play. A good attorney is going to sit down with the, the proposed partners in a limited liability company or even in a general partnership and work out, hash out the details of how they wish to run that business together, who's going to do what, what the responsibilities are going to be, how profits are going to be distributed, what kind of tax election, if any, is going to be made. That is what the purpose of the operating agreement is. Registered agent. An LLC must generally have a registered agent in the state where the registered office is located, as well as in other states where the LLC conducts business. When an LLC is sued, the legal papers are served on that registered agent. It is required that the registered office is a street address. A registered agent can be an individual or a legal entity. So the bottom line is, when you do business in any state, People who do business with you need to be able to identify <laughs> who you are and how to get hold of you physically in person. And if you, are, for example, are running your business from your home and you do not want people to be able to come to your home because you want to have a sense of privacy there, you could employ a registered agent and use the services of that registered agent. And so if someone decides that they want to sue your business or serve papers on your business, they can instead give those to the registered agent and you will have been considered served if your registered agent receives that paperwork. And then obviously the registered agent needs to know how to get hold of you. Domestic versus foreign LLC. LLCs organized under a particular state statute are referred to in that state as domestic limited liability companies. When operating in states other than those in which they were formed, LLCs are referred to as foreign limited liability companies. So let's just suppose you decide to form an LLC in the state of Washington. You form your LLC in Washington, and as far as Washington is concerned, you are a domestic LLC. But if you cross over and decide to do business in Idaho or Montana, both those states would consider your LLC to be foreign because your LLC was not formed in those states. Now, to form a domestic LLC, the usual procedure is to file articles of organization and pay a non-refundable processing fee to the business registry of the state in which the LLC is being formed. Before filing articles of organization, the desired name should be checked for availability. The name must be distinguishable from other active names on the business registry records, and in addition, the name of the LLC must contain the words limited liability company or the abbreviation LLC with little decimal points or LLC without them. In other words, if you're registering your business as an LLC, it needs to be apparent and obvious to anyone who does business with the LLC that you are an LLC. If the business name is distinguishable and the articles conform to state statutes, the business registry of the applicable state will process the document and return an acknowledgement to the filer. Let's compare that with a foreign LLC. <clears throat> Excuse me. An LLC formed in a state other than that in which it is operating is a foreign LLC. If the LLC wants to conduct business in a state other than the, than the state in which it was formed, it may be required to obtain permission from the other state or states in which it wishes to conduct business. Most states require that the LLC submit an application of authority, which includes the name and the address of the local registered agent, as well as a processing fee, which must be submitted to the state business registry. A certificate of existence or similar document from the jurisdiction where the LLC was organized must be submitted with the application form. Before an application of authority is filed, the name should be checked for availability, and although, the regist although registered in another state, the name must again be distinguishable from other active names in the new state's business registry records. So for example, let's just suppose you've been running your business in the state that you're in under a particular assumed business name, and now you decide you want to expand and add an office in another state. 
Well, you're going to need to check with that state's business registry to see if the name you've been using is even available because it could be that another business there is already using that name. And if another business is already using that name, then you're probably going to need to come up with a new name for your business in that state. So your business might have one name in one state and another name in another state, and there really wouldn't be much that you could do about that uh, in that situation. The other part that goes on is that you are typically going to have to prove that your business exists or that your entity exists to this new state. So if you cross from Washington into, say, opening up another location in Montana, you're going to need to show the Montana Secretary of State Office that your LLC actually does exist in Washington State. So that would require submitting a form to Washington State to ask them to show that you really do exist. And this is through something called a Certificate of Existence. You ask your home state for the Certificate of Existence, and then you send that Certificate of Existence to the new state that you want to do business in and pay all their fees, and you're up and running. So let's now look at a corporation. A corporation is a legal entity created under state statute by submitting articles of incorporation with the state business registry. A corporation is owned by its shareholders, and the names and number of shares issued to each shareholder are registered in the records of the corporation. The articles of incorporation must state how many shares the corporation has the authority to issue. And there are three main types of corporations, including business corporations, nonprofit corporations, and professional corporations. Businesses and professional corporations are for-profit corporations, and a non-profit corporation is formed for any lawful purpose other than financial profit. A professional corporation is a for-profit corporation formed for the purpose of providing one or more specific types of professional service. Many states require that all shareholders of the professional corporation must be licensed to render the professional services offered through the corporation. And I'll give you an example with what is meant by this. I had a client one year who, who came to me and he wanted to form an S corporation for his chiropractic business. Well, oddly enough, he was an attorney. It seemed to me that as an attorney he could have done that on his own, but apparently he wasn't that kind of attorney. He was an attorney who wanted to be a chiropractor and <laughs> he was hiring me to help him form an S corporation. And I said, uh, he, he was talking about professional corporation, he was talking about making an S election, he was talking about who could be owners. And I said, well, there's nothing at the IRS level that would preclude your non-chiropractic spouse, your wife, from being an owner in the corporation, but I would check with the state of Oregon because there could be something at the state level. So off he went, he came back, and he said, yeah, I checked, and there was nothing to preclude it. So he, we formed the corporation, made his wife a 50% shareholder, got all the letterhead printed, he got signage made, and then lo and behold, he learned that the Board of Chiropractic Medicine here in Oregon did not allow that. So it had nothing to do at all with the Secretary of State Office or the Oregon Department of Revenue. It came right down to the board level about whether or not a corporation in this state that is a professional corporation for a chiropractic business could have owners that are not chiropractors. And so the caution is that when you're dealing with people who are professionals, including CPAs or attorneys or chiropractors or veterinarians, most of those fields of occupation have state boards that govern their conduct. And you should be examining what those board requirements are at the time a corporation is being formed. Now, a corporation is a separate entity from its owners. A corporation acts as a single entity. It exists separately from its owners and continues to exist even though the shareholders may change. As a separate entity, a corporation must file federal and most often state income tax returns. It may own property, it can sue, and it can be sued. Let's talk now about the ownership and management structure of a corporation. A corporation is owned by its shareholders and managed by the board of directors. The shareholders appoint the members to the board of directors. And except for the initial board, the shareholders generally select the directors. The number of directors is determined by the Articles of Incorporation or by the bylaws of the corporation. Election and appointment of officers. Every corporation must have a president and a secretary, and some states require that corporations also have a treasurer. The authority and responsibilities of each officer is described in the corporate bylaws and may be further defined by an employment contract or a job description. Some states allow a single person to hold all three titles within a corporation. The president, the 
person we think of as the head of the company, has the overall executive responsibility for the management of the corporation and is directly responsible for carrying out the orders of the board of directors. He or she is usually elected by the board of directors. The secretary is typically responsible for maintaining the corporate records. And the treasurer is the chief financial officer of the corporation and is responsible for controlling the, and recording its finances, including maintaining corporate bank accounts. Fiscal policy of the corporation may rest with the board of directors and be largely controlled by the president on a day-to-day -day basis, though. The board of directors elects the president and the secretary and adopts bylaws of the corporation. The board may elect or appoint other officers, or the bylaws may prescribe how these officers are selected. The same person can hold two or more offices. So it's possible if with a small corporation, and this is very often the case, that a single person is going to be the president, the secretary, and if necessary, the treasurer all at one time, and they're also going to be the board of directors. So a single person can be all of those things. Obviously, in big corporations, things are very different, that you're going to have a dedicated board. The board is going to be formally deciding key strategies for the corporation and then getting the president and other key vice president type personnel to follow through with their vision. <laughs> but for small business, I'm just going to run my own business, do my own thing, make my day-to-day -day decisions, and I'm everything all at one time. Registered agent, a corporation must have a registered agent with the street address being the registered office. When a corporation is sued, the legal papers are served on that registered agent. This is why there has to be a street address. A registered agent can be an individual or a legal entity. So foreign or domestic under state law. Well, similar to the LLC, a corporation formed under the laws of any state is a domestic corporation in the state of incorporation and a foreign corporation in all other states in which it conducts business. Whether a foreign corporation must register to do business in any state and maintain a registered agent within any state is determined by the laws of each individual state. As a general rule, a corporation will be required to register in a state if it maintains an office in the state, has employees working in the state, or performs services in the state. To determine if a corporation is required to register and or maintain a registered agent within a particular state, and to determine the filing requirements for that state, you should contact the Secretary of State Office for that particular state. So one of the things I commonly see many small business owners have a difficult time grasping, and a lot of tax professionals too, is that you've formed your business, you've been doing your business in your home state for a period of time, and now you decide to cross state lines <laughs> to conduct business in another state. Now, if you're just crossing the state line to sell your product, and then you return to your state and, and carry on the other business activities, and the only reason you passed into a particular state was to sell your product, you're probably not going to have to worry about registering in that state. But if you hire someone to perform services for you in a, another state, odds are you are going to have to take some action. Or if you yourself perform services in another state. So let's just suppose, I'm trying to think of a good example, you are a software engineer. You've been working from your home office in your home state. Let's make that home state, uh, I don't know, Colorado. So you're a software engineer. You've been working from your home office in Colorado. And all of a sudden, you come up with this great opportunity to go work in Alabama for six months on a big project. And you go, well, that's an offer I can't refuse. And so you move temporarily to Alabama to do your work there. Well, you're not giving up your home in Colorado when you're doing it. Your intention is to return to Colorado, and you maintain your home in Colorado. So as far as Colorado is concerned, you're still going to be a resident of Colorado. Your business is still going to need to report income and expenses for Colorado. You're still going to have to file all of your Colorado returns. So what about Alabama? Well, Alabama, it's going to depend on what kind of business you are. If you're nothing more than a sole proprietor, you're probably just going to need to file an Alabama return and report whatever income Alabama wants. But if you are uh, actually a corporation or a limited liability company and you then do business in Alabama, and I know nothing about Alabama. It could be that there's all kinds of special rules I should know that I don't. But you would need, as a preparer, to look up those rules for Alabama. Does Alabama tax corporations? Does Alabama tax small businesses? What are the filing requirements for Alabama? These are all questions that need to be answered. Does the business need to register to even uh, run in Alabama? And if so, how is that done? 
So these are sensible questions that every preparer needs to be asking and every small business owner needs to be asking, but frequently they are not asked. <laughs> and it's basically blinkers on and pretend it never happened to go back to Colorado, refile a return, and hope no one, no, no one notices. One of the other things to be concerned about is that certain types of business activities performed in a state can be subjected to things other than income tax. For example, uh, Washington State has no income tax, but it does have a business occupation tax. So if you go into Washington State to perform services, odds are you need to be filing a B&O return and paying a gross receipts tax to Washington State. So these types of things are often neglected simply because people don't understand that they exist or how to go about figuring it. So foreign or domestic corporation under federal law, though. We talked about a foreign corporation under state law, but what does it mean at the federal level? Well, the IRS considers a corporation formed outside of the United States to be a foreign corporation, and all corporations formed within the United States are domestic corporations as far as the IRS is concerned. So what are the organizational procedures for forming a corporation? Well, once the existence of a corporation is established, an organizational meeting of the board of directors is generally held to adopt bylaws and to elect the officers. In forming a domestic corporation, articles of incorporation and a non-refundable processing fee must generally be submitted to the business registrar of the state in which the corporation is formed. Before articles of corporation are filed, the name should be checked for availability. And just as with LLCs and DBAs, the name must be distinguishable from the other active names in that state's business registry records. If the name is distinguishable and the articles conform to that state's statutes, the business registry will process the document and return an acknowledgement to the filer. Bylaws. The bylaws of the corporation must contain provisions to regulate and manage the affairs of the corporation that are consistent with the statutes of the Articles of Incorporation. So there, what are the advantages of a corporation? Why would someone decide to form a corporation versus an LLC? Are there reasons for doing so? Well, a corporation is a legal entity that is separate from its owners who own shares of stock in the company. So the shareholders are not personally liable for corporate obligations unless corporate formalities have not been observed. And one of the things that happens when a corporation is sued, especially a closely held corporation, is there can be a, an effort made to do what is called pierce the corporate veil. Piercing the corporate veil means basically showing that the corporation was a sham, that these four corporate formalities were not followed. Therefore, really, there was no corporation, and it was just the individuals operating in their own name. It is important that if you formed a corporation specifically for limited liability protection for the owners, that the corporate formalities are properly observed. Now, if you have got a corporation where the, pro the formalities are properly observed, one of the benefits of that will be limited liability. One of the key reasons to form a corporation is the limited liability protection provided to its owners. Because a corporation is considered a separate legal entity, the shareholders have limited liability for the corporation's debts. And the personal assets of the shareholders are not at risk to satisfy debts or liabilities of the corporation. Corporate tax treatment. Since a corporation is a separate legal entity, it pays taxes separate and apart from its owners. The owners of a corporation only pay taxes on corporate profits that are paid to them in the form of wages, salaries, bonuses, and dividends. The corporation pays taxes at the corporate rate on any of its profits. Attractive investment. The built-in structure of a corporation makes it attractive to investors. Capital incentive, the stock structure, also allows a corporation to attract key and talented employees by offering them an ownership interest in the form of stock, options, or stock. Owner-employee, a business owner who works for his or her own business, may become an employee and thus be eligible for reimbursement or deduction of many types of expenses, including health and life insurance. Another benefit for an owner-employee of a corporation is that if the corporation folds, they can go and apply for unemployment insurance, which is something the sole proprietor is not able to do. Operational structure. Corporations have a set management structure. The owners of a corporation are shareholders who elect a board of directors. The board of directors then elects the officers. Other than the election of directors, shareholders do not participate in the operations of the corporation. And then finally, perpetual existence. A corporation continues to exist until the shareholders decide to dissolve or merge it with another business. And t during today's class, I'm going to give you a series of three passwords, uh, but I'm not going to give you one on this first break. 
so do stay tuned for throughout today's class for more for passwords but right now I'm not going to give you a password so we're just going to resume class at the top of the hour all right everyone welcome to back to class the camera should be unfrozen for you and you should have had a chance to get yourself awake <laughs> by walking around for 10 minutes. This part of the class is difficult to be exciting when you're talking about terminology, but I feel the terminology is important. So we're going to continue on. We started the break uh, after we finished talking about some of the benefits of corporations, and now I'm going to talk about some of the disadvantages of corporations. The legal rules and laws that affect corporations can mean that they are not the best entity choice for many small business owners. Disadvantages of the corporate entity status can include complexity. A corporation is a complex business structure that can be costly to start up and to maintain. Fees are assessed for various government filings, including annual report fees that are payable to the Secretary of State. Minimum filing of fees are assessed by state governments on corporate tax returns. For example, Massachusetts' minimum filing fee is $456. California has a minimum filing fee of $800. Even Oregon has a minimum filing fee of $150. Many other states also impose minimum filing fees, and it should be noted that many states also impose similar filing fees, though, on LLCs and partnerships. Double taxation of profits. Profits are taxed at both the corporate level and, again, when they are distributed to shareholders. So when a, a corporation files a tax return, it files Form 1120. It figures its income. It figures its expenses. It comes to a bottom-line profit and pays tax on that profit to the IRS. If it then distributes any of those profits to shareholders in the form of dividends, the shareholders now have to report and pay tax on the dividends that they've received as well, and that creates the double taxation. Corporate formalities must be filed to provide evidence that the corporation is a separate legal entity from its shareholders, and failure to do so may open the shareholders to liabilities for the corporation's debts. Corporate formalities include issuing stock certificates, holding annual meetings, recording the minutes of the meetings, and electing directors or ratifying the status of existing directors. So all of that takes time. If you're a small business you know, with two or three employees, do you really need to be going through all of the, those corporate formalities every year? Do you even stop what you're doing to think about the corporate formalities? Probably not. And so the day comes where uh, legally you need to prove that you are a corporation that has perfected these corporate formalities and you cannot do so. Maybe you didn't even know how to. Paperwork. Paperwork is a huge component of the corporate formalities that have to be followed. Reports and tax returns must be compiled and filed in a timely manner. Business bank accounts and records must be maintained and kept separate from personal accounts and assets. Records must be kept of corporate actions, including meetings of shareholders and board of directors, and licenses must be maintained. So that's the C corporation. Now let's talk about the F corporation. And an S corporation is an interesting animal. It is everything and nothing at the same time. It's really interesting where we've gotten with S corporations over the last 20 years. When I got into this business of taxes back in the early 90s, the, the steps to becoming a, an S corporation where you A, became a corporation, and then B, you made the subchapter S election. And over the years, it's become quite apparent that you don't have to do those two things, that you can become an S-corporation without ever having formed a corporation. So an S-corporation is a very interesting animal or entity type, as we're about to see. The S-corporation structure is identical to a C-corporation structure in many ways, but offers the avoidance of double taxation. Profits and losses of an S-corporation flow through to shareholders who report profit and loss-sharing items on their individual returns. An S-corporation is initially formed in the same manner as the C-corporation, which I just described. You form the C-corporation, then you make an S-election by filing incorporation documents with the state of incorporation. But once the business has incorporated, the owners may decide to elect S-corporation status. The election must generally be made within the first 75 days of the year for which the S election is to become effective. So what are advantages of the S corporation? S corporations are a popular choice for many small businesses. S corporations provide the following legal and tax advantages for owners. Corporate losses can be passed through to the shareholders who may be able to use the losses to offset their income or their income on their personal returns. 
Limited liability protects shareholders from personal liability for corporation debts without requiring the S corporation to pay corporate taxes. It is possible to minimize self-employment tax and FICA taxes because the shareholder profits are not generally subjected to these taxes. So this is a difference from the partnership. With a partnership return, the partnership reports income and expenses on 1065. It flows through the profits to the partners, and the, prof and the partners, if they are active participants in that partnership, are typically going to be subjected to income tax as well as self-employment tax. But at the S corporation level, no self-employment tax is assessed on those corporate distributions. So are there disadvantages to S-corporations? Well, yes, there are, of course. Although S-corporations provide an attractive business model, there are certain disadvantages which should be considered, including regulations and requirements imposed on C-corporations must be held up by an S-corporation. There is a limit on the number of shareholders. Like a C-corporation, it can be costly to set up and follow the corporate formalities. In fact, if you are a C-corporation who has made an S-election, all of the corporate formalities remain unchanged. And so an S corporation is merely a tax election. It is not a change in the type of entity that you are. So if you form the corporation, you have to abide by all of the rules that are imposed on corporations. And the only difference between a regular corporation and an S corporation is how they're taxed. All of the other rules that are imposed on them are basically going to be the same. The IRS closely scrutinizes payments of an S corporation or by an S corporation to a shareholder employee who must receive reasonable compensation that is subject to employment taxes before any non-wage distributions can be made to that shareholder employee. All shareholders, in addition, must be U.S. citizens or residents of the United States. All shareholders must, be, must vote in favor of S corporation status before the election can become effective. And benefits such as health or accident insurance for employee shareholders with at least a 2% shareholder ownership must be treated as wages paid to the shareholder before they can be deducted by the corporation. So that concludes the, the overall look at the different types of business entities. And now we're going to look at how they get taxed. Businesses are generally taxed under default rules applied by the IRS and state governments. However, it is possible for a business to elect other tax treatments as allowed by federal and state laws. For the sole proprietorship, that entity files a Form 1040, because you're an individual. You file a 1040, and to it you attach either Schedule C or CEZ, unless you're a farmer, in which case you'll attach Schedule F. And you do so to meet your federal income tax obligations. Net profits from a sole proprietorship business generally make the proprietor liable for self-employment, Social Security, and Medicare taxes. Schedule SE must be filed with the 1040 return to calculate and report these taxes. With respect to the sole proprietor business, the filing deadline for Schedule C or Schedule F is going to be the same as the filing deadline for the individual return. And for most, the filing deadline is the 15th day of the fourth month following the end of the tax years. And if you are an individual filer on a calendar year, that means your filing deadline will be April 15th. But if that April 15th deadline falls on a weekend or national holiday, then the filing deadline will move to the next business day. An individual can file for an extension of time to file by submitting Form 4868 to the IRS. And uh, it has to be done, of course, by the original due date of the return. And once that return, that form is filed, the, uh, the filer has an additional six months to file, typically taking them to October. What are the fi late filing penalties if you fail to file on time as a sole proprietor? Well, failure to file and late filing penalties are assessed based upon rules that apply to individuals. So there's no special tax or late filing penalty imposed on the Schedule C. Rather, it's imposed on the individual filer that attaches the Schedule C to their return. And so if you're trying to figure out what the late filing penalty is for a business owner who files Schedule C, it's going to be all the rules that apply to individuals. But let's compare those rules to the partnership. A partnership is the relationship between two or more persons or entities who join to carry on a trade or business with each person or entity contributing money, property, or labor, or skill, and each expecting to share in the profits and losses of the business whether or not a formal partnership agreement is made. At the simplest level, a partnership occurs when two or more individuals agree to work together in the active conduct of a trade or business. Individual partners are personally liable for the debts and other obligations of the partnership. 
and partnerships generally file IRS Form 1065. Net profits of the business are generally not taxed at the partnership level, but instead flow through to individual partners who must include their respective profit share in income reported on their individual 1040 return. And conversely, if the partnership runs a loss, the partnership will flow that loss through to the partners who will claim, if they are eligible to claim, that loss against other income on the return. Generally, partners who are active participants in their partnerships must pay self-employment tax on their share of partnership earnings, and many cities require that businesses apply for and maintain a current business license, and partners must comply with other state and local laws as well. For domestic partnerships, except as provided below, every domestic partnership must file Form 1065 unless it neither receives income nor incurs any expenditures treated as deductions or credits for federal income tax purposes. Entities formed as LLCs that are classified as partnerships for federal income tax purposes also must file Form 1065. For foreign partnerships, generally a foreign partnership that has gross income effectively connected with the conduct of a trade or business within the United States or has gross income derived from sources in the United States must file Form 1065 even if its principal place of business is outside of the United States or all of its members are foreign persons. A foreign partnership required to file a return generally must report all of its foreign as well as its U.S. source income. Partnership filing deadlines and penalties, these are quite a bit different than we see for the sole proprietor. Every partnership engaged in a trade or business must file a return. The filing deadline, extension, and penalty rules for partnerships are described next. First, we have the Form 1065 filing deadline. For Form 1065, your filing deadline is the 15th day of the fourth month, which is actually the same as for individuals. So for partnerships that are calendar year partnerships, the filing deadline is going to be April 15th. But again, if that falls on a weekend or national holiday, then it's going to move to the next business day. Now, if the partnership is unable to file a timely return, it can request an extension by filing Form 7004, Application for Automatic Extension of Time to File Certain Business Income Tax Information and Other Returns to Extend the Filing Deadline by Five Months. For calendar year partnerships, a timely filed Form 7004 will extend the filing deadline to September 15th. So for individuals, a six-month extension takes you to October 15th, but for partnerships, it's a five-month extension that will take you until September 15th, which is a full month earlier. There are penalties for failure to file a return, and there are $195 per month per partner for each month or part of a month, up to a maximum of 12 months. Well, that can get pretty spendy. The penalty is assessed against the partnership. And an additional $100 penalty may be imposed with respect to each Schedule K-1 that the partnership fails to provide to each partner on time. So now you're up to $295 per month per partner. The $100 penalty also applies if the partnership fails to correctly include all required information on each partner's K-1. Now, there are some rules that will waive the penalty for small partnerships. The penalty will be abated if the partnership can show reasonable cause for its late filing. Domestic partnerships with 10 or fewer partners will generally qualify for the reasonable cause exception if all partners have fully reported their shares of income, deductions, and credits on their own timely filed returns, and each partner is an individual, a C corporation, or an estate of a deceased taxpayer or deceased partner. To request a waiver of penalty for late follow, filing, you should follow Revenue Procedure 84-35 as it was amended in 1997. For corporations, a domestic U.S. corporation is formed when articles of incorporation are filed with the Secretary of State Office of any state. Unless exempt under Section 501, all domestic corporations, including corporations in bankruptcy, must file an income tax return whether or not they have taxable income. Domestic corporations must file Form 1120 unless they are required to file a special return. You should see special returns for certain organizations, which are shown in this chart below, and unless the corporation elects to be taxed as an S corporation by timely filing Form 2553, most U.S. corporations are going to be filing Form 1120. Now, there are some special returns for certain types of organizations, and instead of filing 1120, those organizations will file a different alternative type of form that you see here. For example, if you are an exempt organization with unrelated trade or business or, uh, income, in other words, you're a nonprofit organization, 
um, you would file Form 990-T. Um, you can see here that obviously if you're an LLC, uh, then you would typically be filing Form 1065. If you're a Subchapter T cooperative association, including a farmer's co-op, then you would file 1120-C. If you are a condominium management or residential real estate management or timeshare association, you typically file Form 1120-H. And there are also political organizations that would file 1120-POL and so forth. Let's talk now about the taxation of the limited liability company. The formation of a corporation under the laws of any state is the formation of a corporate entity under the rules of the Internal Revenue Code. In other words, the IRS recognizes the formation of a corporation as the formation of a specific entity type that it will tax in a very specific way. All corporations are required to file Form 1120. No similar guidance, however, applies to limited liability companies because the formation of an LLC does not create a single kind of taxable entity. Instead, the makeup of the ownership of an LLC will determine what kind of tax return that LLC needs to file. Depending on the number of members an LLC has, the IRS will automatically classify the LLC as either a sole proprietorship or a partnership. If the only member of an LLC is a single individual, the LLC is treated as a disregarded entity for tax purposes. Income and expenses are going to be reported on Form 1040, Schedule C, E, or F. So here's one of the real common things I get. Actually, one of the most common reasons we will be contacted by a prospective new client, and sometimes even by existing clients, is they've decided to go into business. Or maybe they were already in business. This is another one. I have a client who's already in business. They've been preparing their tax returns for years filing sole proprietor business income and expenses on Schedule C. The big day has come and they formed an LLC and they're the only member of the LLC and so they call me. They're all excited because everything has probably changed now that they're an LLC and the answer is nothing changed <laughs> as far as the IRS is concerned for tax purposes. Now, if they have employees and they're filing payroll reports, there are some changes we need to be concerned with there. But if it's just you know an independent contractor that was doing business as a handyman for the last 10 years and now he's decided to form an LLC and it's still his handyman business and nothing else has changed, then as far as IRS is concerned, that new entity, that formation of the LLC, they couldn't care less about it. The entity is disregarded. A disregarded entity is an eligible entity that is treated as not being separate from its single owner. Its separate existence is ignored for federal tax purposes unless it elects corporate tax treatment. If the LLC has only one owner, it will automatically be considered to be a sole proprietorship for income tax purposes. A sole proprietorship is referred to as an entity to be disregarded as separate from its owner, unless an election is made to be treated as a corporation. If you prefer to be treated as a corporation instead of as a disregarded entity, Form 8832 must be submitted to make that entity classification election. Single member LLCs may not file a partnership return. So what if the single member of the LLC is a corporation? Because that could happen. You could have a corporation that decides to form an LLC, and the corporation is the sole owner of that LLC. Well, IRS says if the only member of the LLC is a corporation, then the LLC income and expenses are reported on the corporation's tax return, which is usually Form 1120, or it could be 1120S. If the single member LLC is owned by a corporation or a partnership, the LLC should be reflected on its owner's federal tax return as a division of the corporation or partnership. Multi-member um, LLCs. Most LLCs with more than one member are going to file Form 1065 partnership return. But if you would rather file as a corporation, Form 8832 must be submitted. You don't need to file Form 8832 if you want to be filing as a partnership. An LLC with two or more members files the same tax forms as a partnership. Self-employment taxes for members of LLCs filing Form 1065. Generally, a partnership LLC is taxed in the same manner as an ordinary partnership. However, there is a difference in the treatment regarding self-employment tax in that active members pay self-employment tax on their share of the LLC partnership earnings. But inactive members, who are the equivalent of limited partners, do not pay self-employment tax on their earnings unless the LLC pays them for services. Joint ownership of LLC by spouse in a community property state. In Revenue Procedure 2002-69, and there's a link here that you can click on if you want to read more, 
address the issue of classification for an entity that is solely owned by a husband and wife as community property under the laws of a state, a foreign country, or a possession of the United States. Now, most states in the United States are not community property states. I happen to sit in Oregon. We are a non-community property state, and so these rules would not apply to businesses or individuals residing in the state of Oregon. Um, but we're surrounded by community property states. That is Oregon is. We've got Washington to the north, Idaho to the east, California to the south. There's a number of other community property states as well as when you go into the southern United States. I don't have them all on my head, but there's roughly around 10 community property states, which is a significant number, but even more significant is the fact that most states are not community property states. So if you're in a community property state, it would behoove you to be, be familiar with the rules that affect individuals in community property states. And these rules apply only to individuals who are residents of community property states. If there is a qualified entity owned by a husband and wife as community property owners and they treat that entity as a disregarded entity for federal tax purposes, the Internal Revenue Service will accept the position that the entity is a disregarded entity for federal tax purposes. And if they decide to treat that entity as a partnership for federal tax purposes, then the IRS will accept the position that the entity is a partnership for federal tax purposes. A change in the reporting position will be treated for federal purposes as a conversion of the entity. A business entity is a qualified entity if the business entity is wholly owned by a husband and wife, and this actually would be spouses, as community property under the laws of a state, a foreign country, or a possession of the United States. No person other than one or both spouses would be considered an owner for federal tax purposes, and the business entity is not treated as a corporation under IRC Section Code 310 7701-2. Now, joint ownership of an LLC by a spouse in a non-community property state. If an LLC is owned by a married couple in a non-community property state, which is most of the country, the, L the LLC should file as a partnership. LLCs owned by a married couple are not eligible to be qualified joint ventures, which can elect not to be treated as partnerships because these are state law entities. So this is one of the interesting things. We say that IRS says, well, the formation of an LLC is really not necessarily going to be recognized by us or by the IRS, but in fact, they, there is something very significant going on here. And I had to deal with this a few years ago. Had a client, husband and wife, they are graphic designers. I'd been doing their tax returns for years. Two Schedule Cs, he, he was, actually she was a graphic designer and he was a writer. So they complemented each other, but they each had their own clients and sometimes they worked together, but often they didn't. And one day they contacted me very excited to let me know that they'd formed an LLC. And the sad part about that was that uh, they were pretty nickel and dime, very, very careful with their money. And the formation of the LLC meant that I had to prepare a partnership return for them. The Schedule C days were over. And they were pretty unhappy with that position that all of a sudden their tax preparation fee ballooned because they had decided to form this LLC and I really highly question whether an LLC was even necessary. In fact, what they could have done is each of them could have formed two separate LLCs, <laughs> each in their own name and continued filing Schedule C as they always had done. But instead they formed one LLC with both of them as members of the LLC. Because Oregon is a non-community property state, it automatically forced them into filing a partnership return. Taxation elections. So we've been talking about how the various entity types are taxed. And now I'm going to tell you that they don't have to be taxed that way, that they can actually choose to be taxed in a way other than what we would call the default way. The Internal Revenue Code provides automatic tax classification to businesses. And under the default rules, businesses will automatically be required to file as follows. They'll file a Schedule C or F if they are a sole proprietor or a single member LLC. They'll file Form 1065 if they are a partnership or multi-member LLC. They'll file Form 1120 if they are a C corporation, and they'll file Form 1120S if they are an S corporation. Well, that all seems perfectly clear, except now we're going to muddy the water. Certain types of business entities can change their classification for tax purposes by filing Form 8832, Entity Classification Election, with the IRS. So what is this entity classification? Well, it's essentially saying, even though I am this, I'm going to pretend I'm that. And the IRS is going to allow that if you go through the procedures. An entity may be recognized under the federal or state laws as an individual, a partnership, or a corporation. 
and an entity designated as a corporation under state law must file a corporate tax return using either Form 1120 or 1120S as applicable. But a domestic entity that is not a corporation is going to automatically be classified as either a sole proprietorship if they are owned by a single individual or as a partnership if the business has two or more owners. And the table that I'm going to show you on the next page provides a useful reference for determining the default tax treatment that is given to sole proprietorships, partnerships, LLCs, and corporations. An entity is automatically taxed under the default rules by the IRS unless it decides to be taxed in a way other than the default rules. And it does this through entity classification election and the filing of Form 8832. So let's take a look at this chart. I'm going to zoom in on it a little, make it a little bit bigger. And we can see that we have the domestic entity type and then how it is automatically going to be taxed under the default rules by the IRS. But a choice can be made to be taxed in another way by filing Form 8832 or Form 2553 or a combination of the two. And in the final column, we can see the choice that would never be available to that particular entity type. So firstly, let's look at the sole proprietor who is an individual owner. The default treatment by the IRS is to file Schedule C or F as a sole proprietor. But that sole proprietor can actually make a corporate election to be taxed either as a C corporation or as an S corporation. But the sole proprietor would never be taxed as a partnership. Under the partnership entity type, we have to have at least two or more owners. And when there are two or more owners in a partnership, the default classification is a partnership and that partnership files form 1065. But a partnership can make an election to be taxed as a corporation. It can also make an election if it qualifies to be taxed as an S corporation. But a partnership would never file Schedule C to be taxed as a sole proprietor. Now, a C corporation is pretty straightforward. A C corporation is automatically a corporation that files Form 1120. And if it files 2553 and is comprised of the proper makeup and is awarded the S corporation status, it can choose to file as an S corporation. But a C corporation would never have the option available to it of filing as a partnership or as a sole proprietorship. For the S corporation, an S corporation is obviously recognized by the IRS as an S corporation when the formalities are completed. And an S corporation is always going to file as an S corporation on Form 1120S unless it decides to revoke that S election status and revert to a C corporation. But an S corporation would never file as a sole proprietorship or as a partnership. For the LLC, we have to look at who makes the LLC up. Does the LLC have one owner or more than one owner? If it has one owner, it is automatically classified as a sole proprietor and it files Schedule C or F, but an LLC member can also, like the sole proprietor, make an election to be taxed as a corporation and even as an S corporation. But a single member LLC would never get taxed as a partnership. And with a, a multi-member LLC, the classification is automatically partnership. But again, that multi-member LLC could choose through election to be taxed as if it was a corporation. Or it could elect to be taxed as an S corporation, but it would never be taxed as a sole proprietor. So what we're seeing is that out of all of these different entity types, the S corporation and the C corporation are the ones that really are, remain constant. They're always corporations. And either you're making a tax election to be taxed as an S corporation or you're not. It's going to be pretty simple. You're filing 1120 or 1120S. But when we're dealing with these individual business owners, partnerships, and limited liability companies, we can see that things are a little more malleable, that we can make some decisions about how we want to file. So in effect, a single member LLC or a sole proprietor, without actually ever forming a corporation, could decide that it wants to pay taxes as if it was a corporation. Why would they want to do that? <laughs> well, actually, there can be some reasons to do that. I, I kind of like the idea that you may not have to go through all of those corporate formalities to prove that you're a corporation and still be able to file the tax return and take some of the tax advantages that are, that are available to corporations. It's a rather interesting concept. So if you want to make that election to be taxed as a corporation, you do so by filing Form 8832, and that's what we're going to talk about now. Generally, an eligible entity that does not file Form 8832 is going to be classified under the default rules that we just covered up here, unless an election is made by filing Form 8832. 
A domestic eligible entity is a partnership if it has two or more members or is disregarded as an entity separate from its owner if it has only one owner. Eligible entities, including sole proprietorships, partnerships, and most limited liability companies can elect to change their classification to be taxed under a different entity status. To make an election to be taxed under another eligible status, an eligible entity must generally file Form 8832 to elect that different classification. The IRS uses information provided on Form 8832 to establish the entity's filing and reporting requirements for federal tax purposes. So here is Form 8832. We're going to take a look at it now. And I've essentially highlighted the key areas of the form that I think are relevant. I've filed this form a number of times over the years and kind of plunk it on the desk in front of you and start trying to figure it out. So I'm going to help you along a little bit with that if it's new to you. On the name of the eligible entity making the election, you should enter the name of the eligible entity that is electing to be classified. So if it was an LLC, uh, you'd put the LLC name here. If it's a sole proprietor, you'd put the sole proprietor name here. And then you enter the identification number in the area of this box that's a little bit bluish in color. For the employer identification number, you should show the EIN of the eligible entity that is electing to be classified. Do not put applied for on this line. An entity that has an EIN will retain that EIN even if its federal tax classification changes. So if you are an LLC and you applied for an EIN for that LLC, and now you are making an election for that LLC to be taxed as a corporation, you're not going to apply for a new employer identification number because the entity itself is still the same. It's still an LLC. What's, the only thing that's changing is how that LLC is going to be taxed by the IRS. And so the IRS wants continuity, wants that LLC to retain its existing employer ID number. Now, if a disregarded entity's classification changes so that it becomes recognized as a partnership or association for federal tax purposes, and that entity had an EIN, then the entity must continue to use that EIN. If the entity did not already own an EIN, then the entity must apply for an EIN and may not use the identifying number of the single owner. For example, Jenny's Cafe LLC is a single member LLC owned by Jenny Smith, which is a disregarded entity for tax purposes. Jenny's Cafe is making an election to be taxable as a corporation. If Jenny's Cafe has received a federal EIN, it should enter that EIN on the Form 8832, but do not enter the Social Security number of the single owner that is Jenny Smith. Next, we go on to line one where we make a checkbox here for the type of election. Is this an initial classification by a newly formed entity, or is this a change in the current classification of an existing entity? If the entity is choosing a classification for the first time, that is, the entity does not want to be classified under the applicable default classification, do not file this form if the entity wants to be classified under the default rules. So let's just suppose you're forming a new LLC as a single member LLC. And from the get-out, you know you want to be taxed as a corporation and not as a sole proprietor. So from the very first onset of forming your LLC, you file this form. You would check box 1A to say that this is an initial classification. On the other hand, if you don't want to be taxed as a corporation and you would rather be taxed as a sole proprietor, you don't file the form at all. And for box B, you would check this box if the entity is changing its current classification. So let's just suppose you've been operating as a single member LLC filing Schedule C for a number of years and you've decided that without forming a corporation, you would like to be taxed as if you were a corporation. And so you're going to change your entity classification from sole proprietor to corporation by checking box 1B. Now moving on to lines 2A, has the eligible entity previously filed an entity election that had an effective date within the last 60 months, that is five years? Once an eligible entity makes an election to change its classification, the entity generally cannot change its classification by election again during the 60 months after the effective date of the election. However, the IRS may, by a private letter ruling, permit the entity to change its classification by election inside of that 60-month period if more than 50% of the ownership interest in the entity as of the effective date of the election are owned by persons that did not own any interest in the entity on the effective date of the entity's prior election. So what this is saying is once you have 
made an election for your entity to change its tax classification, the IRS does not want you to make another change in under five years. It wants you to wait five years before you change your mind again. However, if one of the reasons that you're making a change in that entity classification is that more than 50% of the ownership has changed since that initial election, then the IRS could consider allowing you to change inside of that 60-month window, but it needs to be done through a private letter ruling. You should note that the 60-month limitation, though, does not apply if the previous election was made by a newly eligible entity and was effective from the date of formation. So let's just suppose you've got um, a newly formed LLC with two members, and they agree at the time that they form the LLC that they don't want to be taxed as a partnership, they want to be taxed as a corporation. So that, that partnership or that newly formed LLC would file Form 8832 and check Box 1A for initial classification. And IRS is saying that because from the very onset you've been taxed as a corporation, that that 60-month rule would not apply to you, and you could subsequent to that decide to revert and go to a partnership. And then on line five, if the eligible entity is owned by one or more affiliated corporations that file a consolidated return, provide the employer identification number of the parent corporation. And on line four, if the eligible entity has only one owner, provide the following information about that single owner. Who is the one person and who, what is the identifying number of that one person? So that is page one of Form 8832. Let's move on now to page two. And on page two, we're going to select the type of entity that is making the election. You can see that we have a domestic eligible entity electing to be classified as a, an association that is taxable as a corporation. So if you're a, a sole proprietor or a single member LLC, uh, then you would check box 6A. But if you are already um, an LLC that's previously been taxed as a corporation and you wish to revert to being taxed as a partnership, then you would check box 6B. If you are a domestic eligible entity with a single owner elected to be disregarded as a separate entity, then you would check this box, and so on. So you check the appropriate box if you are changing your current classification, no matter how you achieved it, or you are electing out of a default classification. Do not file Form 8832 if your default classification is the actual classification that you want to use. For example, Jacob's Tree Service LLC is a newly formed multi-member LLC, and under the default rules, Jacob's Tree Service is automatically classified as a partnership. Jacob's Tree Service would only file Form 8832 if it is electing to be taxed as a corporation, in which, checks it, in which case it would check Box A. If Jacob's Tree Service wishes to be taxed as a partnership, then Form 8832 should not be filed at all. Moving on to line eight, election is to be effective beginning the date and month. The IRS actually wants to know what date you want this election to take effect. Uh, if you leave the box of blank or the line blank, they're going to make the election effective the date they receive the form. But typically you're gonna think this through and make a decision about what date you want this entity classification election to take effect. An, ent an election specifying an entity's classification for federal tax purposes, though, cannot be more than 75 days prior to the date the election is filed or later than 12 months after the date on which the election is filed. So if I file this form today and I want it to take effect for January 1 of 2015, I'm going to have a problem because that is more than 75 days prior to the date that the form is being filed. Also, if I want this entity classification to take effect as of the first day of 2017, I have a problem because that is more than 12 months in the future. So the IRS wants to see a date entered on here that is not more than 75 days earlier than today's date and not more than 12 months after today's date. And then in uh, this section right here that you see in yellow, this is the consent statement and signature section. Form 8832 must be signed by each member of the electing entity who is an owner at the time the election is filed, or any officer, manager, or member of the electing entity that is authorized under local law or the organizational documents to make the election. And the elector does need to represent that they have the authorization under penalties of perjury. If an election is to be effective for any period of time prior to the time it is filed, then each person who was an owner between the date of the election and the date that it becomes effective 
must also sign. If you need a continuation sheet or a separate statement, attach that to Form 8832, and the separate consent statement must contain all of the same information that's contained on the form. Do not sign the copy that is attached to your tax return. Then we move on to page three of the document, and on page three you've got part two where you can make a late election relief. So this is rather interesting because up here it says do not enter a date earlier than 75 days uh, prior to today's date or not more than 12 months after today's date. But then down here we say, oh, <clears throat> maybe you can <laughs> because there are some late election procedures. So if you're going to use a late ele election procedure, you need to explain the reason for the failure to timely file your entity election classification. And then finally, in the signatures section of part two, this must be signed by an authorized representative of the eligible entity and also by each effective person. The individual or individuals who sign the declaration must have personal knowledge of the facts and circumstances related to the election. So let's talk a little bit about these elections and what they mean next. An LLC with a single member is classified as a disregarded entity taxable as a sole proprietorship unless it decides to file Form 8832. And a multi-member LLC will automatically be classified as a partnership unless it elects to file Form 8832. The following rules apply to limited li liability companies where there is a change in the number of members. A change in the number of members in an LLC does not affect the entity's classification as long as there are two or more members. An LLC that is classified and taxed as a partnership, though, will become a disregarded entity taxable on Form 1040 Schedule C if the entity's membership is reduced to only one member. And an LLC that is treated as a disregarded entity taxable on Form 1040 Schedule C will be classified and taxed as a partnership if the entity grows to more than one member. But a change in the number of members in an LLC that is filed Form 8832 to elect to be taxed either as a C corporation or perhaps later on as an S corporation will have no effect on the elected corporation classification. So an LLC that is elected corporate classification will continue to be taxed as a corporation by the IRS regardless of the number of members that it has. And here are some examples of what I mean. In this first example, we have a single member LLC that adds a member. Jenny is the single owner of the LLC, Jenny's Cafe, and for the past three years, Jenny has reported income and expenses of the LLC on Schedule C with her Form 1040 return. On July 1 of 2014, Jenny decided to bring in a partner, Jeff, into her business. Jeff contributed capital of $20,000 to the business in exchange for his 20% share of ownership. Then on 7-1 of 14, Jenny's Cafe became a partnership because it now has two or more members. Jenny's Cafe will need to file two short year returns, and for the period of January 1 through June 30th, Jenny's Cafe will report income and expenses on Jenny's personal return with a Schedule C attached. And for the period of July 1 through December 31, and for any future years, Jenny's Cafe will file a partnership return on Form 1065. Let's look at the next example where we have a single member LLC filing as an S corporation and it adds a member. We assume the same facts as in the example we just described except that Jenny's Cafe made an election to be taxed as an S corporation in an earlier year and is reporting income and expenses on Form 1120S. The addition of Jeff as an additional member has no effect on the tax status of Jenny's Cafe so the LLC will continue to file Form 1120S. In example number three, we have a multi-member LLC that adds a member. Assume the same facts as in example one, except that Jenny's Cafe was originally formed by Jenny and Jeff three years ago. And on July 1st of 2014, they decide to bring in a third member, Jessica. Because Jenny's Cafe had two or more members in the earlier years, it has been required to file Form 1065, and the addition of Jessica as a third member does not change the entity status. As such, it will continue to file Form 1065, until the number of partners reduces down to one or it makes an S election or C corporation election. So let's now look at the definition of association. For purposes of Form 8832, an association is an eligible entity that is taxable as a corporation by election. The federal tax treatment of elective changes in classification as described in regulations is summarized as follows. If an eligible entity classified as a partnership elects to be classified as an association, it is deemed that the partnership contributes all of its assets and liabilities to the association in exchange for stock in the association 
and immediately thereafter, the partnership will liquidate by distributing the stock of the association to its partners. If an eligible entity that is disregarded as an entity separate from its owner elects to be classified as an association, then the owner of the eligible entity is deemed to have contributed all of the assets and liabilities of the entity to the association in exchange for stock in the association. So what the IRS is simply saying is that even though you're not a corporation, you're going to de be deemed to be treated as a corporation, you're going to be deemed to have stock in the corporation. And so all of the normal treatment that would be awarded in a situation for a stock owner is going to apply. Employer ID numbers. With respect to employer identification numbers, there is a difference in this disregarded entity treatment. Disregarded entities, that is single member LLCs, are not disregarded for employment tax and excise tax purposes. Beginning in 2008, disregarded entities including single member limited liability companies that are disregarded as separate from their owner, as well as qualified subchapter S subsidiaries, are required to file excise returns using the disregarded entity's name and EIN rather than its owner's name and EIN. So what this is saying is, if you are an individual that formed an LLC, the LLC is not recognized for tax purposes unless you file Form 8832. And so you would file typically Schedule C. But if you hire employees for your business, the employment situation is going to be treated as a separate entity. And so for employment purposes, the LLC does need to apply for an EIN. And you should use the EIN of the LLC for filing payroll reports. But the EIN of the LLC is not entered anywhere on the personal return. It is only entered on the payroll reports. Now this filing requirement for disregarded entities also applies to employment tax returns effective for wages paid on or after January 1, 2009, disregarded entities not previously needing an EIN may now need to apply for an EIN for the pay repayment and reporting of these taxes. So where do you file Form 8832? Well, it depends on where in the country or in the world you are. If you are in any of the states listed in this top box, then you file Form 8832 with the Cincinnati Office of the IRS. If you are living in any of the states shown here, then you would file in Ogden, Utah. And if you are in a foreign country or a U.S. possession, you also file with Ogden, Utah, but you have that little suffix on the end. You should also attach a copy of Form 8832 to the entity's federal income tax or information return for the tax year of the election. If the entity is not required to file a return for that year, a copy of its Form 8832 must be attached to the federal income tax or information return for all direct or indirect owners of the entity for the tax year that includes the date on which that election took effect. Although failure to attach a copy of Form 8832 will not invalidate an otherwise valid election, each member of the entity is required to file returns that are consistent with the entity's election. Penalties may be assessed against persons who are required to but do not attach Form 8832 to their return, and other penalties may apply for filing federal income tax or information returns that are inconsistent with the entity's election. For more information on how to make an entity classification, you can, of course, refer to the Form 8832 instructions. And now we're going to talk about the due date for filing Form 8832 and also what to do if you uh, find out that the window of time for filing the form has passed. What do you do? Can you file late? And if so, how do you go about doing that? Well, Form 8832 can generally be filed at any time the IRS will begin recognizing the selected entity classification as follows. Generally, the election will take effect on the date that is entered on line 8 of Form 8832 or on the date Form 8832 is filed if no date is entered on line 8. However, IRS recognition of the classification can begin no later than 75 days prior to the date the election is filed or 12 months after the date on which the election is filed. Now, if line 8 of Form 8832 shows a date that is more than 75 days prior to the date on which the election is filed, then the election will take effect 75 days before the date it is filed. So let's just suppose you're filing the, the form on August 1, 2015, and you want it to take effect January 1, 2015. The IRS is automatically going to process that and apply it 75 days earlier. It's not going to give you that January 1 date. We've just talked about the filing deadlines for Form 8832, and what we'll do is we'll take another break, rest your mind, and I'll get the camera unlocked for you. 
But after the break, we're going to come back and talk about late election relief and what you do if you want to make an entity classification that is outside that window of time. Password number one is Scotia. S-C-O-T-I-A. Scotia. All right, everyone. Welcome back from break. Hopefully you've got your computers are able to see me and you're able to see your manual. We're going to be getting into Form 1065 during this next segment as well. And so if you've not already printed out a copy of Form 1065, you probably should. It's just going to make it easier for you to follow along with me because I'll be talking about a particular line of the form. And it's nice if you have that line of the form right in front of you at the time. So we were talking about how an entity can decide to be taxed in a way other than its default status, and that that is typically done by filing Form 8832, and that there are time frames by which 8832 must be filed. The IRS also have procedures in place, though, for late election, called a late election relief. And an eligible entity may be eligible for late election relief under Internal Revenue Code Procedure 2009-41 as well as 2009 4 if each of the following requirements is met. Number one, the entity failed to obtain its requested classification as of the date of its formation or upon the entity's classification becoming relevant or failed to obtain its requested change in classification solely because the form was not filed on time. And either the entity has not filed a federal return or the, for the first year for which the election was intended because the due date for that year has not yet passed, or the entity has timely filed all of the required federal tax returns and information returns, or if not timely filed, at least within six months after the due date, excluding extensions, consistent with its requested classification for all of the years that the entity intended the requested election to be effective, and no inconsistent tax or information returns have been filed by or with respect to the entity during any of those years. Now, if the eligible entity is not required to file a federal return or information return, then each affected person who is required to file a federal tax return or information return must have timely filed all such returns consistent with the entity's requested classification for all of the years that the entity intended the requested election to be effective and no inconsistent tax or information returns have been filed during any of the years. So essentially what this is saying is you are supposed to have this return, this form, 8832, filed within 75 days prior to the date you want it to take effect. But if you file it late, you can still be treated as being given an earlier classification date if the filing deadline for the return to which it applies has not yet passed, or even if that deadline has passed, you actually filed a form that is consistent with the entity classification you're selecting. So let's just suppose you are an LLC that decided that you wanted to be taxed as a corporation. And so you filed Form 1120 as a corporation. You sent it off and the IRS sent it back saying that you're not a corporation. <laughs> well, you could at that point say, oh, well, we thought we were a corporation. We're going to attach this 8832 to make sure that election is accepted. And because you filed as a corporation even though you weren't, and now you're submitting this 8832 and resubmitting it again, that would be a situation where the IRS is going to accept it even though it's late. Now, the entity ha must have reasonable cause for failure to timely make the entity classification, and also there is a limit on how far late election can be granted, and that is three years and 75 days from the requested effective date of the eligible entity's classification election has not passed. An effective person referred to in the requirement 2B or 2A above includes any direct or indirect owner of the electing entity that would have been required to attach a copy of the Form 8832 to their federal income tax return for the year. So how do you obtain relief? Well, Form 8832 contains a checkbox and a description area that I showed you earlier for making the election. You need to file Form 8832 with the applicable IRS office within three years and 75 days from the date, the requested effective date of the entity's classification election. And then on page one of the form, put a check in the box, late classification relief sought under Internal Revenue Procedure 2009-41. You then complete part two of Form 8832, which is page three. And on line 11, you explain the reason for the failure to timely file an entity classification election. 
Part 2 must be signed by an authorized representative of the eligible entity as well as each affected person. The individual or individuals who sign the declaration must have personal knowledge of the facts and circumstances that are relating to the election. And an additional copy of Form 8832 must be attached to either the eligible entities or the affected person's return. If Revenue Procedure 2009-41 does not apply, an entity may seek relief for a late election by requesting a private letter ruling and paying a user fee. So let's talk about the effect of entity classification and S election on the tax year. Now, formation of a new partnership or multi-member LLC or a corporation can occur on the first day of the year. More often, however, a partnership or corporation will be formed at another time during the year. Similarly, the dissolution of a partnership LLC or corporation can occur on a day other than the last day of the year. And when that happens, a short year return is often filed by partnerships and corporations on the first and last year of business. In addition to the formation or dissolution of a partnership, multi-member LLC or corporation, either of the following events can trigger a short year. Firstly, Form 8832 Entity Classification Election is filed by an entity electing to begin or end corporate tax treatment. If the election occurs on a date other than January 1, there will generally need to be two short year returns filed. Or Form 2553 Election by a Small Corporation is filed or revoked. In the year a corporation begins or ends its S election status, the corporation may need to file a short year 1120 and an 1120S tax return. And here is an example where an entity change has created two short year returns. On August 1, 2014, Tribbles LLC, a multi-member LLC, filed IRS Form 2553 to elect S Corporation status. Tribbles LLC is a calendar year filer. For tax year 2014, Tribbles LLC will file two short year returns as follows. Form 1065 with the short tax year of January 1 through July 31, and Form 1120S with the short tax year of August 1 through December 31. Tribbles LLC members will then receive two Schedule K-1s for tax year 2014, and one K-1 will report income from the 1065 election, or from the 1065 filing, and the second K-1 will report income from the 1120S filing, thereby reflecting income earned by Tribbles LLC under each of its entity statuses. You should note that the due date for partnership returns is the 15th day of the fourth month following the end of the partnership's year. And for partnerships that are filing calendar year returns, then that filing deadline would be April 15th. But for Tribbles LLC with that short year return, that means that the partnership's final 1065 has a year end of July 31. And that means that it's a 15th day of the fourth month would put you on November 15th of the same year, <laughs> the same calendar year that is. Or if an extension is filed, it would give another five months to timely file that return. So that's one of the other things to be making note of. If you help a client make an entity classification choice, you should be really aware of what time in the year you've done that. If you've made an entity classification choice that takes part, place midway through a year, you have to be aware of that we now have a short year and what the filing deadline is for that short year and not kind of just forget about it until they come in at filing time because by then it could be too late. In other words, a late filing that could be subjected to some penalties. So this is the point where we are getting on with looking at the 1065 form. Now there are a lot of similarities and a number of differences between Form 1065 and Form 1120S. If you're trying to file like a 2015 tax return and the 2015 forms aren't out yet, the IRS actually, uh, that's what you have up here. You see at the top of the form, I'll just zoom in so you can see it. Oops, too far a zoom. I'm just seeing a, a chat in the chat box there. The question is, what if the forms aren't available to file and you're partway through a year? That's why you see for calendar year 2014 or tax year beginning or ending, in 2014 and ending on a different date. And I've also seen people actually draw a line through 2014 and handwrite 2015 on there. Those are the methods that I've seen done to deal with that. All right, so here we are now on Form 1065. And we're going to spend a good part of the day looking at 1065. When we come back to class for part two of this course, we're going to begin that class by comparing 1065 to 1120S, and then we're going to really get in depth into 1120S. But today, because we're talking about LLCs and because the default classification of a multi-member LLC is a partnership, 
I felt that we should start with the partnership return. And then in our next class, we'll look at what happens if an LLC makes an S-corporation election or whether you have a corporation that makes an S-corporation election. How is that handled in terms of how do we prepare that S that S-corporation return? So to start with, I'm a very form-based person. Uh, I like IRS forms. To me, um, forms help uh, clarify the tax law. If I don't understand a form and how to fill it out, it's probably because I don't understand the tax law surrounding it. The form is being used to apply the tax law. So when I'm studying a form and trying to understand it, uh, what I'm really trying to do is understand the law that applies to the form and why are they filling the form out in the way that they are? Why is this piece of information requested on the form? There's a rhyme and a reason behind all of it. IRS employs people who sit in rooms for weeks and months at a time designing and redesigning these forms as they're trying to apply certain aspects of tax law. And so I figure I'm going to take all of that effort they put and take that to my advantage, A, by understanding the form, and B, by reading the instructions that help me interpret the form. And then if the instructions aren't enough, then I may go farther into it and start reading code, God forbid. <laughs> reading code is very boring, but sometimes necessary. And uh, then, of course, the IRS publications can be a little bit more entertaining. And then finally, if I'm still not understanding something, I can just do general internet searches and end up on websites of law firms and so forth reading uh, opinions that they have. But I always prefer to start with the form itself and uh, work outwards from there. So when we're looking at the 1065, the first thing to be aware of is that it is a five-page form. And I'm showing you page one. And further than breaking the 1065 into five pages, I'm going to take each page and divide it into its component parts. And I'll call those component parts sections. Now, these sections are not described in the IRS instructions. These are my instructions. Uh, essentially, I look at the form, and I can see these sections, and, and that's how we're going to take it. And the first section you can see is the identification information. In this top section in yellow, you're going to provide the IRS with information that identifies your partnership and the type of elections and so forth that might apply to that partnership. There's some specific information that we're listing up here, and I'm going to get into that in a minute. We then move on down the form to the business income section. And I'm calling it business income, although it says income, we have to be very specific that it refer references business income. IRS hasn't said business income here, but that's what it means, and I'll show you why. And then we see business deductions. And it doesn't say business deductions, but again, only business deductions are allowed here. Other deductions are not allowed here and are entered in other parts of the form. And then in the final section, we have signatures. This is where the tax return gets signed. So let's take a look first at page one, and we're going to begin with that first top section, which is where we enter identification information. The top section of page one is used to provide information about the business that is filing the tax return, and care should be taken to properly provide all of the information that is requested in this section. Now, one of the things our firm does, and every firm really should have procedures in place to do this, and that is review tax returns. Whoever did the tax return, someone else needs to be reviewing that tax return. And whoever is reviewing that tax return should be looking for the types of things that are easy to miss. It can be all-encompassing, or the focus of, of preparing a tax return is, have I got all the numbers right? How, am I balancing to the profit and loss? Have I put income and expenses on the correct lines? Am I doing all of those things correctly? And, and the focus is all on that, and there's like a, a brow wipe when I'm all done. Whew, I got it. It balances. Yeehaw, I'm done. When in fact, <laughs> there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, and it's easy to miss. And uh, that's why having another person review the work can be beneficial. Firstly, they can make sure that you are, in fact, balancing as you think you are. But secondly, to just look for all of those mundane little boxes and information fields that need to be filled in that, quite frankly, often just don't get filled in, embarrassingly so. And what happens is when the client picks up this tax return that they just paid you a bunch of money to prepare, and they sit down and look at it, and you haven't entered any of the information that is requested in these boxes up here, it just makes you look really bad. So we're going to talk about the identification information section, and I just don't want you to discount it. It should always be a priority that you can get this part right. And again, you should have some kind of a double-check procedure in place to catch errors, specifically omissions, where these fields are just entirely left blank. 
And it is possible when these fields are left blank to still electronically submit a return. They're not necessarily going to cause the return to reject, but they certainly are errors when they're not filled in. So we're going to take a look firstly up at the top here. Zoom in again. And you can see that on 1065, the first box is box A, and it asks for the principal business activity of the business and the principal product or service. And the IRS wants you to enter a description for each of these. We then go on to business code number. And the appropriate activity code for a principal type of business of an S corporation or partnership can be obtained from the instructions for those forms. And so you just simply go into the instructions for either form 1065 or form 1120S and look up the code that is appropriate for the type of business that you are operating and then enter that code in here. Whether you're an S corporation or a partnership, the code is identical. Then we move on to a box D, employer identification number. You should enter the EIN of the partnership in this space and if the partnership does not have an EIN, then it must be applied for. On line, box E, you enter the date that the business started. And then on box F, you enter total assets. And then it has a note there to see the instructions. Well, the reason it says see instructions is you may or may not have to enter a number there. Partnerships who answer yes to question six on form 1065 section B, or schedule B, do not need to complete box F. A partnership must answer no, however, to question six, and then would be required to make an entry in box F if any of the following is true. One, the gross receipts of the business are equal to or greater than 250,000, or the total assets of the partnership are equal to or greater than a million, or Schedule K-1 was not timely provided to all partners by the due date of the return, including extensions. In other words, this is a late return. Or the partnership is required to complete Schedule M-3. Item number G, check applicable boxes. So let's go up and take a look at these applicable boxes. We've got check applicable boxes. Initial return, final return, name change, address change, amended return. Technical termination, but if this is a technical termination, also check either box one for an initial return or technical termination plus box two for a final return. So let's talk a little bit about that. You check the applicable box as appropriate for the Form 1065 that is being filed. You should check the technical termination box if there has been a technical termination of the partnership. A technical termination occurs if any one of the following is true. All operations are discontinued and no part of any business, financial or operation or venture, is continued by any of its partners in a partnership or at least 50% of the total interest in partnership capital and profits is sold or exchanged within a 12-month period, including a sale or exchange to another partner. The partnership year ends on the date of termination, and in the case of one above, the date of termination is the date that all operations cease and the business winds up its affairs, or in the case of two above, the date of transfer of 50% or more interest in the partnership capital and profits. With respect to a te technical termination, Section 708B provides that a termination occurs where within a 12-month period there is a sale or exchange of 50% or more of the total interest in the partnership capital and profits. This is known as a type B termination or technical termination. If a technical termination has occurred, you will need to prepare two returns for the year of termination. On the final return of the old partnership, you will check box G2, final return, as well as box G6, technical termination. And then on the initial return of the new partnership, you will check box G1, initial return, and box G6, technical termination. A new EIN is not needed in a technical termination. The new partnership will continue to use the EIN of the terminated partnership. You should prepare your returns for the appropriate tax period reflected in the respective partnership interests during that time. And for, for more information, you should see item G on the front page of Form 1065 and the instructions. Accounting method is the next box, box H. Every taxpayer, whether an individual or a business entity, must figure taxable income on an annual accounting period that is called a tax year. The calendar year is the most common tax years, but other tax years are a fiscal year or a short tax year. And each taxpayer must also use a consistent accounting method. An accounting method is a set of rules for determining when to report income and expenses. The most commonly used accounting methods are the cash method and the accrual method. 
Under the cash method, you generally report income in the tax year in which you receive it, and you deduct expenses in the tax year in which you pay them. Under the accrual method, you generally report income in the tax year in which you earn it, regardless of when payment is received, and you deduct expenses in the tax year you incur them, regardless of when payment is made. There's also something called a combination or a hybrid method, and generally, and except as otherwise required, you can use any combination of cash accrual and special methods of accounting if the combination clearly reflects your income and you use it consistently. However, there are the following restrictions that apply. Firstly, if an inventory is necessary to account for your income, you must use an accrual method for purchases and sales. Generally, you can use the cash method for all other items of income and expense. But if you use one method for reporting your income, you must use the same method for reporting your expenses. And any combination that includes the cash method is treated as a cash method for purposes of Section 448. Next up, we have Box I. Enter the number of Schedule K-1s that are attached. The partnership must issue a Schedule K-1 to each partner who had an ownership interest in the partnership during the year. So it's possible that the beginning and ending number of partners in a partnership is going to be smaller than the number of partners who owned interest in the partnership for the year. And there needs to be a K-1 for every person or entity that had an interest in that partnership during the year, and the IRS wants to know how many K-1s are supposed to be attached to the return. Item number J, check if Schedules C and M3 are attached. A partnership must complete Schedule M3 net income loss reconciliation instead of Schedule M1 if any of the following applies. The amount of total assets at the end of the year is $10 million or more. The amount of adjusted total assets for the tax year is $10 million or more. The amount of total receipts for the tax year is $35 million or more. Or an entity that is a reportable entity partner owns or is deemed to own directly or indirectly 50% or more of the partnership's capital profit or loss on any day during the year. A partnership not required to file Schedule M3 can voluntarily choose to file Schedule M3 instead of Schedule M1, and a partnership that files Schedule M3 must also file Form 1065 Schedule C, additional information for Schedule M3 filers. So that's the, t that's the, uh, the end of what we're going to talk about with the information section of the 1065, and now we're going to move on to that second piece of the form where we ha report income. And remember earlier I said you report business income in this section. And here it says caution, only trade or business income and expenses are entered on lines 1A through 22 below. See the instructions for more information. You should report only gross income from the business activity minus cost of goods sold in this section. If cost of goods sold is shown on line 2, complete form 1125A for form 1065. Do not include portfolio income or income from rental property in this income section. Portfolio income includes interest, dividend, and capital gain income that is earned from bank account holdings and stock holdings that are owned by the partnership. On line 1A, you will enter the gross receipts or sales. Gross receipts or sales come from trades or business activities of the partnership. On line 1B, you will enter cash and credit refunds the partnership made to customers for returned merchandise as well as rebates and other allowances that are made on gross receipts or sales. Then on line two, you enter cost of goods sold. And if you are entering an expense for cost of goods sold, you need to complete and attach form 8835A. And once you've completed that form, you will then carry the total from that form over to line two of 1065. On line four, you will enter the ordinary income or loss from other partnerships, estates, and trusts. If the partnership owns an interest in another partnership or trust and received a K-1, enter the amount of ordinary income or loss from that other partnership or trust on line 4. You should attach a statement to the tax return that shows the name, address, and employer identification number of the partnership or trust that issued that K-1, but do not include the following kinds of income from that partnership or trust on this line. Portfolio income, rental income or loss, or publicly traded partnership income. If you're reporting income from a publicly traded partnership, also called a PTP, you include that income on Schedule K line 11 and on Schedule K1 in box 11 using a code F. And if the amount included on line 4 is a loss from another partnership, the amount of the loss that can be claimed 
may be subject to at-risk and basis limitations as is appropriate. Moving on to line five, this is where net profit or loss from farming is entered. You would enter the partnership's net profit or loss from farming, and if you are reporting farming income and expenses, you attach a Schedule F. And it's the same Schedule F that you would use and attach to Form 1040 if you were filing for a sole proprietor. Do not include, though, on this line any farm profit or loss from other partnerships, and also do not include any Section 179 deduction on this line. Line six, net gain or loss from Form 4797. You report on this line the gain or loss from the sale exchange or involuntary conversion of assets used by the partnership in a trade or business activity. Do not include on this line the sale of assets that are used in a rental activity of the partnership. Also, do not use this line to report a recapture of the Section 179 expense deduction that was previously passed through two partners. Instead, report any recapture on Schedule K1, Box 20, with a code L. Line seven, other income or loss, enter any other trade or business income not included on lines 1A through 6. Examples of other incomes reported on this line include interest income charged on receivable balances, recoveries of bad debts deducted in prior years, taxable income from insurance proceeds. The recapture amount under section 280F if the business use of listed property drops to 50% or less. If this happens, you complete and attach Form 4797 Part 4 to show how that recapture amount is figured. And finally, five income adjustments resulting from a change in accounting method. All right, so that's the income section, what you would report there. Now let's look at deductions. And you're going to use the deductions section to report operational expenses of the business activity. Allowable expenses of the business activity should be entered on lines 9 through 21 according to the categories that are provided for on these lines. And then all other deductible expenses of the partnership's business activity, not including rental real estate expenses reportable on 8825, and other rental expenses reported on Schedule K Line 3, which we're going to discuss a little bit later in today's class, these are lumped together as a total amount on Line 20. And the statement should be attached to the return describing each expense category and the amount that is included on Line 20. Total deductions are then entered on line 21, and a net ordinary business income or loss is shown on line 22. The amount from line 22 will then carry over to line 1 of Schedule K, which is located on page 4 of Form 1065. Now let's talk about the types of deductions that you would not enter on lines 9 through 20. You do not report ex the following expenses anywhere on page 1 of Form 1065. Rental activities expenses. Rental activity expenses are reported on Form 8825 or on Line 3B of Schedule K. Or deductions that are allocable to portfolio income. You report these deductions on Line 13D of Schedule K and in Box 13 of Schedule K1 using codes I, K, or L. Do not enter non-deductible expenses. For example, expenses connected with the production of tax-exempt income or the non-deductible part of the meal or entertainment expenses. Report non-deductible expenses on line 18C of Schedule K and in box 18 of Schedule K1 using a code C. Qualified expenditures to which an election under Section 59E may apply, including circulation expenses, research and experimental expenditures, intangible drilling and development costs, or mining exploration and development costs. And finally, do not enter as an expense on page 1 of 1065 Items that the partnership must state separately that require separate computations by the partners. Examples of these types of separately stated items include expenses incurred for the production of income instead of in a trade or business, charitable contributions, foreign taxes paid or accrued, intangible drilling and development costs, soil and water conservation expenditures, and amortizable basis of reforestation expenditures and exploration expenditures. The distributive shares of these expenses are reported separately to each partner on Schedule K-1. Also, there are some limitations on deductions relating to COGS. Do not include uh, as expenses on lines 9 through 21 any cost of goods sold expenses that have already been included on Form 1125A. That seems self-evident. If the partnership is an eligible small business, it may be able to claim certain cost of goods sold expenses as the cost of supplies or materials. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more uh, later in today's class when we get to page 64 of the manual. Reporting trade or business activity deductions, 
You report only trade or business activity deductions on lines 9 through 20 as described next. On line 9, you will enter salaries and wages. Deduct only salaries and wages paid to employees of the partnership. Do not include any payments that are made to independent contractors or partners of the partnership on this line. And this seems like a pretty mundane line, but it's actually a point where I'm going to stop and divert your attention for a little bit. Because what happens with um, small business owners who form LLCs or just decide to form a partnership together is they don't know any better. They think that they formed a business and they're paying all their employees and they need to pay themselves too. And they'll go off and hire ADP or Paychex or some other payroll company. A salesperson will come down, uh, ask them for, to fill out W-4s for all of the employees, have them fill out some forms, and they'll do all of that. And then they'll start submitting their payroll each a week or every two weeks to the payroll service that they're using. And the payroll reports get filed. And at the end of the year, they get these W-2s. And as far as these small business owners are concerned, they've done everything correctly. They think that they've followed through with all of their legal obligations and they've done things right until they come in to get their taxes done. Now, when they come in and get their taxes done, they may or may not find out that they've made a mistake. That would depend on the competence of the tax professional that they're working with. But if the tax professional understands the rules relating to partnerships, then the tax professional is going to say, wait, stop. Because if you did payroll on yourself, as an owner of your partnership or as a member of your LLC, you cannot pay yourself on a W-2. Uh, the line instructions are very specific. Deduct only salaries and wages paid to employees of the partnership and do not include payments made to partners of the partnership on this line. In effect, a partner in a partnership is never an employee of the partnership. And this is where clients of mine, more often than I would like to see happen, this happens, that uh, they've engaged in all of these procedures to do payroll on themselves, and now I get to tell them, but wait, you shouldn't have done that. You're kind of in a pickle now. Line 10 is actually where compensation to partners is entered as an expense, and this is the guaranteed payment line. The partnership may claim a deduction for payments made to a partner in exchange for services provided to the partnership. Medical insurance premiums paid on behalf of partners, partner spouses, or partner's dependents are also included on this line. So let's just go back up and take a look at this uh, 1065 lines 9 and 10 again. If the partnership has employees, then it needs to pay those employees on a W-2, and the amount of wage paid to those employees is entered as an expense on line 9. If the partnership made payments to any of the partners for services those partners rendered to the partnership, then those would be entered on line 10. Now, it's possible for partners in a partnership not to receive guaranteed payments and not to have received payroll. It's possible that they've taken profit shares from the partnership just throughout the year when money seemed available, but there, there was no you know, direct allocation that this profit share is awarded to you based on services provided. It's just we've gotten to the midpoint of the year. We have this much money. Uh, we're going to give you this amount. And so the, partnership, or the partners take their distributive share of the partnership income at that point in the year. Uh, it could be that that is considered to be a guaranteed payment if it was a payment for services, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a guaranteed payment. Um, but if it was payroll that went to the partner, then we're going to get to into a little bit later um, what needs to be done when payroll is paid when it shouldn't have been. But this is the line, line 10, where payments to partners are entered, and it should not have been through payroll. Okay, so passing on the guaranteed payments, we're now on to line 11, repairs and maintenance. Include on this line the cost of repairs and maintenance that are incidental to the cost of owning property used for income production and do not add to its value or prolong its useful life. On line 12, you enter bad debts if the partnership has included in income an amount which is fully or partially uncollectible. Include an expense for the amount of bad debt that was previously included in income on this line. So a cash basis partnership will never have a bad debt. Bad debts are only going to apply when you have an accrual uh, filing partnership that's using the accrual method of accounting. And then on line 13, rent. Include on this line the amount the partnership paid in rents for the year. Do not include any rent paid by the partnership for a dwelling unit that is occupied by a partner in the partnership. If the partnership leased a vehicle, an inclusion amount may need to be included on this line, and you can refer to IRS Publication 463 for information on how to figure the inclusion amount, 
Also complete Form 4562 Part 5 to report business use of vehicle information. We actually briefly talk about inclusion amounts in a course I teach called Depreciation Made Easy. That's the one place I can tell you to go. But IRS Publication 463 also provides information on inclusions. Line 14, taxes and licenses. Enter the amount paid for taxes and licenses in the trade or business that have not been deducted elsewhere on this line. Examples of taxes and licenses would be payroll taxes, but do not include payroll taxes that were withheld from employee pay. For example, if you're paying an employee a gross wage for the month of $1,000, but their net check is only $800 because you withheld payroll taxes from their pay, you would enter $1,000 as wage income on the wage line, you would not enter any of the amount withheld from that employee's pay as a tax, because that tax is not your tax. But if you make a matching tax, which most employers are required to do, you're required to make a matching tax payment on your employee's wage, then the employer match amount is an amount that you would enter on line 14, as well as any other license amounts or taxes that you paid. Line 15, interest. Include interest incurred in the trade or business activities of the partnership that is not claimed elsewhere on the return, but do not include the following interest expense amounts on this line. Debt used to purchase rental property. This type of interest expense is claimed on Form 8825. Debt used to buy investment property. Debt required to be allocated to the production of property. This kind of debt must generally be allocated to the cost of producing the property under cost of goods sold prepaid interest, which can generally only be deducted over the life of the loan, interest paid to a partner in the partnership for the use of capital, this type of interest payment should be treated as a guaranteed payment to the partner. Line 16, depreciation, do not include on line 16 any section 179 expense. If you're filing a sole proprietor return with a Schedule C, you use Form 4562 to figure and claim the Section 179 deduction, and that Section 179 deduction flows through to the Schedule C and is entered on the depreciation line of the Schedule C. But partnerships are not allowed to claim a Section 179 deduction. The Section 179 deduction is going to flow through to the individual partners, and they will claim that deduction on their own individual returns. Line 17, depletion. If the partnership is claiming a deduction for timber depletion, you would complete Form T for timber and then enter the deduction here. Do not include a deduction for depletion on oil and gas properties on this line. Deductions for oil and gas properties are separately reported on Schedule K-1. Line 18, retirement plans. Enter amounts contributed by the partnership to the retirement plans of common law employees of the partnership. Employers who maintain a pension, profit sharing, or other funded deferred compensation plan other than a SEP or simple IRA must generally file one of the following forms. Form 5500, Annual Return or Report of Employee Benefit Plan, or Form 550SF, which is the short form, or Form 5500EZ, Annual Return of a One Participant Plan. Do not include, however, on this line amounts that the partnership contributed to the retirement plans of partners. These amounts are reported on Schedule K-1 in Box 13 using Code R and are deducted by the partners on their individual returns. Payments made to retirement accounts on behalf of employees under a salary reduction plan. Instead, the partners should claim a deduction for salaries or wages paid to the employees on Form 1065 Line 9. So again, this is similar to payroll tax. If you have a monthly wage that you're paying to an employee of $1,000 and that employee decides to divert $100 to their 401k plan. That's their money. It's not a deduction you claim. You claim the $1,000 you paid them as a wage, and it doesn't matter whether the wage you paid was divided between taxes, take-home, and contributions to their 401k plan. You're going to claim that flat gross wage as your expense. Um, the only time you would claim a deduction for contributions made to an employee retirement plan is if you are making a matching contribution out of your business pocket to that employee's account and it's not a reduction to their wage. Line 19, employee benefit programs. Enter the partnership's contributions to the employee benefit program not claimed elsewhere on the return. An example of an expense to include on this line is employee health insurance. Do not include, though, health insurance payments for any partner or for a spouse or a dependent of any partner. Health insurance expenses of partners are reported on line 10 as a guaranteed payment. 
And finally, line 20, other deductions. You enter a total of all other allowable trade or business expenses of the partnership on this line. Then attach a statement to the return that describes the type and amount of each expense. And examples of expenses that can be included on this line are amortization, allowable deductions for business startup and organizational costs, deduction for certain energy-efficient commercial building property, gifts, insurance premiums, legal and professional fees, meals and entertainment expenses, membership dues, supplies used and consumed in the business, travel and utilities. So we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about these, but I will talk about a couple of items. One of these is the business and startup organizational costs, because it typically will cost some money to form your partnership. Generally, a partnership can elect to deduct up to $5,000 of business startup and organizational costs paid or incurred after October 22, 2004. And these are separate amounts, up to $5,000 of startup, up to $5,000 of organizational. Any remaining costs are capitalized and then amortized over a 15-year period. The $5,000 deduction is reduced but not below zero by the amount of total costs that exceed $50,000. If the total costs are $55,000 or more, then the deduction is reduced to zero, and any costs not deduct must be amortized. The partnership generally elects to deduct startup costs by claiming the deduction on its return filed by the due date, including extensions for the year in which the active trade or our, our business begins. Under gifts, the deduction for gift expenses is generally limited to $25 per person per year, and for purposes of the gift rule, a family member of a person is considered to be the person. So you can't get around the gift rule by giving a business client a $25 gift and then giving their spouse another $25 gift. That would be deemed to be a $50 gift. Amounts treated as compensation. Generally, the partnership may be able to deduct otherwise non-deductible entertainment, amusement, or recreational expenses if the amounts are treated as compensation to the recipient and reported on Form W-2 for an employee or on Form 1099 miscellaneous for an independent contractor. So the outright deduction for a gift is limited to $25 a year, but let's just suppose that really the gift is a form of compensation. You would then deduct that gift not as a gift expense, but as the actual expense that it is deemed to be. So for example, if you give an employee a $5,000 reward for years of service, then that $5,000 reward would actually need to be grossed up and claimed as a payroll expense. Meal and entertainment expenses. Generally, the partnership can deduct only 50% of the amount otherwise allowable for meals and entertainment expenses paid or incurred in its trade or business. In addition, subject to exceptions under Section 274, the meals must not be lavish or extravagant, and a bona fide business discussion must occur during, immediately before, or immediately after the meal, and a partner or employee of the partnership must be present at the meal. 80% of meal expenses allocable to travel away from home may be deducted if the meals are consumed by individuals subject to the hours of service limits of the Department of Transportation. Membership dues, the partnership may deduct amounts paid or incurred for membership dues in the following kinds of organizations. Civic or public service organizations, professional organizations such as bar and medical associations, business leagues, trade associations, chambers of commerce, boards of trade, and real estate boards. However, no deduction is allowed if the principal purpose of the organization is to entertain or provide entertainment facilities for members or their guests. So we could say, say, a golf club membership or a health club membership. Or the dues are for membership in any club organized for business, pleasure, recreation, or other social purpose. This includes country clubs, golf, and athletic clubs, airline and hotel clubs, and clubs operated to provide meals under conditions favorable to a business discussion. Travel, the partnership cannot deduct travel expenses of any individual accompanying a partner or partnership employee, including a spouse or a dependent of the partner or employee, unless that individual is an employee of the partnership and his or her travel is for a bona fide business purpose and would otherwise be deductible by that individual. Expenses not reported on line 20. Do not include the following types of expenses on line 20. You can see that there's a limited number of lines. We just go back up here. There's really not a lot of lines here for entering deductions. Salaries, guaranteed payments, repairs, bad debts, rent, taxes, licenses, interest, depreciation, depreciation depletion, retirement plans, employee benefit programs, and then everything else. 
there's not a lot of description left there, so it stands to reason that there's a lot of things that you would automatically think are going to go on the other deduction line, and so it's important to pay attention to what you do not enter on that other deduction line. Do not enter, as an expense on line 20, items that must be separately stated on schedules K and K1. Real estate expenses, fines or penalties paid to a government for violating any law, for example, parking tickets. Expenses allocable to tax-exempt income. Report these expenses on Schedule K, Line 18C. Net operating losses. Only individuals and corporations can claim an NOL. Amount paid to political candidates, parties, or campaigns to influence the public regarding legislative matters, elections, or referendums. Report these amounts on Schedule K, Line 18C. Amounts paid or incurred to influence federal or state legislation or to influence actions or positions of certain federal executive branch officials. However, certain in-house lobbying expenditures that do not exceed $2,000 may be deductible. Also, do not enter charitable contributions anywhere as an expense or the cost of entertainment facilities. Regarding entertainment facilities, the partnership cannot deduct an expense paid or incurred for a facility such as a yachting or hunting lodge used for an activity usually considered to be entertainment, amusement, or recreation. And finally, Section 4, where we enter signatures. Form 1065 must be signed by a general partner or LLC member to be valid. In a certain situations where a return is filed for a partnership by a receiver or trustee, the fiduciary must sign the return. Also, a paid tax return preparer other than an employee of the partnership is required to sign the return. All right, so we are at the top of the hour due for our final break of the day. I'm going to give you a password again. Um, and when we come back from that break, the course is actually going to move much more quickly. And in the final hour of the course, we're going to be continuing with the discussion of the 1065 return, but we're also going to be looking at how to complete each section of the form. So we've just finished talking about page one of the form, and when we come back from our break, we're going to take a look at how to take a sample illustration and take numbers from that illustration and put them on the form. So I'm going to give you your second password of the day. Password number two is computer, C-O-M-P-U-T-E-R, computer. Okay, everyone, welcome back to class, and we're going to now take a look at an illustration where we're going to use this illustration to complete Form 1065. And the characters in this story are Kira and Jadzia, who are 50-50 partners in DAX LLC. DAX LLC is a consulting business in which Kira and Jadzia participated equally. Their P&L is shown below, and DAX LLC will claim a Section 179 deduction for assets that were purchased during the year. What we'd like to do now is prepare page one of Form 1065 for DAX LLC, and we're going to do it as shown next. So here we've got the P&L for DAX LLC, and we've kept it pretty simple. And I've basically highlighted in various colors the things that should leap out at you as being relevant. Firstly, we can see that total income for the year is $110,050, but of that $110,050, $50 is checking account interest. And we've already learned in the class that you don't enter portfolio income as income on the front page of the tax return. And so that means that on the line one of the tax return, we're going to enter $110,000 instead of $110,050. Now we know under expenses that charitable donations are not deductible to the partnership and are not included on page one. So even though we've listed an expense here of $500 for charity, we know we need to leave that off of page one. Also, computer and office equipment purchases. Since I've told you in the wording of the problem that DAX LLC is going to be claiming a Section 179 deduction for these expenses, we know that we're not going to enter a depreciation deduction on the front page of 1040, or not on the front page of 1040, but on the front page of 1065 for the computer equipment. So that's another $10,000 difference between the profit and loss and the return. And then finally, meals and entertainment. 50% of meals and entertainment expense is not deductible for tax purposes. And so although the P&L shows that meal expenses were $1,000, we know that $500 is going to be the amount of the deduction that can be claimed. So Form 1065 provides dedicated lines for only a few of the expenses shown here, including repairs in the amount of $300, 
rent in the amount of $5,000 and interest in the amount of $100. So these expenses do have dedicated lines on Form 1065, but all of the other expenses shown here that are included on page one of 1065, these are gonna to have to be included on a separate statement. Finally, the net profit per DAX LLC books, as you can see right here, is $79,050. However, $50 of interest income is not reportable on page one of Form 1065. Also, the following expenses are not deductible on page one. The charity, the section 179 deduction, and 50% of meals. So the total amount of non-deductible expenses is 11,000, and the total amount of non includable income is $50. Therefore, the net ordinary business of DAX LLC that is going to be entered on line 22 of 1065 is $90,000 rather than the $79,050 that we see on the P&L. So moving over to the 1065, we begin by entering $110,000 on the line 1A, remembering to leave the $50 out. We then enter the repair, rent, and interest expenses from the P&L. And then we move on to line 20. And on line 20, we're going to prepare a statement. And on this statement, we list all of the other allowable expenses, including meals and entertainment after subjecting that expense to the 50% limit. We total those expenses up and we get $14,600 and enter that on line 20. We then add up the total deductions and they come to $20,000 for the year. We subtract 20 from 110 and we get $90,000. So let's now move on to page two. Schedule B, on page two, you can see right here, it's called Schedule B. This schedule is used to report information that must be disclosed to the IRS about the partnership. And you use Schedule B to report the method of accounting, the business activity description, and other questions relating to the partnership. Schedule B was re revised for tax years after 2007 to provide space to enter information identifying ownership relationships between the partnership and other entities. Then in 2009, it was revised again to add lines 3A and 3B. And if the yes box is checked on these lines, then Schedule B1 also needs to be filled out. I'm not going to read through you all of the lines here, but if we go up to line one, it says what type of entity is filing this at return. This is the point where you actually tell the IRS whether this is a general partnership, a domestic limited liability company, a foreign partnership, et cetera. And then over here, you can see line three at the end of the year, did any foreign or domestic corporation, partnership, trust, or tax-exempt organization, or any foreign government own directly or indirectly an interest of 50% or more in the profit, loss, or capital of the partnership? And then on line 3B, it says, did any individual or estate directly or indirectly own an interest of 50% or more? If you answer yes to either of these questions, then you have to complete the additional Schedule B-1. Then down at the bottom, it says, does the partnership satisfy all of the following conditions? This is the, literally the place where we keep referring, did the partnership answer yes or no to question six? This is question six. I'll just zoom in a little so you can see it. Does the partnership satisfy all four of the following conditions? A, the partnership total receipts for the year were less than 250. The partnership's total assets for the year were less than a million. Schedule K-1s were filed with the partnership return and furnished to all partners on or before the due date of the return. And is the partnership is not filing and is not required to file Schedule M-3. If you're able to answer yes, then this is deemed to be a, a more simple return and you don't have to complete Schedule L, M-1, or M-2, or answer item F on page one of the form. We'll see that I'm going to prepare those schedules for DAX LLC anyway, I prefer to do those schedules because I find that they help improve the accuracy of the tax return and help me determine whether my client is missing money. <laughs> Which any IRS auditor, that's going to be the first thing they zero in on is where has the money gone? Is all of the money being accounted for? And those schedules really help you to balance the return to the income and expense activity of the bank account of the business. Now on line one, you should indicate the type of entity that is filing the return, and if this is a general partnership, check box A, and if it's an LLC, check box C. Lines two to four, answer all questions yes or no, and if you answer yes to question 3A or 3B, attach schedule B, and this is it right here. If you are dealing with a partnership that is owned only by individuals or estates, you would typically move down to part two, and you would list the name, social security number, country of citizenship, and the percentage that partner owned in the partnership if they owned 50% or more of the partnership.
Then we move on to page three. Page three is a continuation of Schedule B. You answer yes or no to each question listed. Beginning in tax year 2008, Schedule B was expanded to include questions relating to canceled debt, prior year distributions, and contributions to other entities of property that are received in like kind exchanges. Then for 2011 and later years, new questions 18A and B were added that require the partnership to disclose whether or not it made payments that are required to be reported on Form 1099. And if so required, did the partnership actually issue those forms? Space is then provided at the bottom of page three to enter information identifying the designated tax matters partner. A tax matters partner should be indicated if the partnership is subjected to rules for consolidated audit proceedings. And then form 1065, page four, schedule K. So page one of the 1065 is where we enter the business income and expenses of the business activity of the partnership. But there are other types of income and expenses that are not entered on page one. What do you do with those? Well, they get entered here on Schedule K. Schedule K is used to report certain net income and deduction items as they must be allocated to the partners. Schedule K reports the combined total of each reportable item that will flow through to all the partners. The sum of the combined amounts for each line number on all partners' Schedule K1s should match the corresponding line amounts that are shown on Schedule K, and Schedule K can be divided into the seven sections that you see here. In Section 1, we are entering income and loss amounts. In Section 2, we're entering deduction amounts. In Section 3, we're entering information relating to self-employment. Uh, line or Section 4 is for credits. Section 5 is for foreign transactions. Section 6 is for alternative minimum tax items and section seven is for other information. So we're gonna take each of these sections in turn, beginning with section one on income or loss. On line one, you will enter net income from the partnership's business activity. After you finish completing page one, you will have a number on line 22 of page one. Whatever that number is, you're gonna carry it over and enter it on line one of schedule K. You then move on to line two, and this is the line used to report income from rental real estate activities. If the partnership engaged in a rental real estate activity, it's going to attach form 8825. 8825 is very similar to Schedule E in its function and purpose. Schedule E that is attached to the individual returns is used to report income and expenses from uh, rental properties. And so if the partnership owns rental properties, it's going to prepare the equivalent form 8825. Whatever amount of net income or loss that is figured on 8825, you're gonna enter that on line two of the Schedule K. Then on line three, you are entering other gross rental income. Enter gross income from rental activities other than real estate activities that are reported on form 8825. You should also attach a statement to describe the expenses that are reported on line 3B. Line four, guaranteed payments. Report guaranteed payments remade, made to the partners or LLC members here. So on 1065, on line 22, you figure a net income or loss amount that carries to line one. And on line 10 of the page one of the 1065, that's where you list guaranteed payments. Whatever amount you've listed on page one, line 10 as a guaranteed payment, you're gonna carry and enter that again on line four. Actually, there is a, an adjustment to that line. Then on line five, you're gonna enter interest income that comes from portfolio income. You would not enter interest that is received on accounts receivable, but if you have bank account holdings, you know, money in the bank and it earned interest, that is where you enter that interest income. And on line 10, then you're gonna enter the net section 1231 gain or loss. You report gains or losses from the sale, disposition, or involuntary conversion of section 1230 assets that are held for income production on this line. We're not gonna get into completion of Form 4797 in this course at all. I have another course that we discussed that. It's called Sale of Business Assets, where we look in depth at Form 4797, but not more than that today. And then on line 11, other income or losses not reported on lines one through 10, those are entered here. Next, we're gonna look at section two of Schedule K, which is the partner's distributive share of deductions. Certain expenses, such as the section 179 deduction, investment interest expense and charitable deductions or contributions are not deductible directly by the partnership and are not reflected in the net income that is shown on line 22 of form 1065. Instead, these deductions flow through to the tax returns of the individual partners or members who claim each deduction on a pro rata basis. For charitable contributions, cash contributions of any amount must be supported by a, date, a dated bank record or receipt 
and her charitable contributions made during the tax year on line 13A, then attach a statement to Form 1065 that separately identifies the partnership's contribution for each of the following categories. The following codes should be used to report charitable contributions that are entered on Schedule K-1. You need to identify the contribution as a cash contribution or a non-cash contribution, and then is the cash contribution a 50% limit organization or was it made to a 30% limit organization? That will dictate how much deduction the individual partner is allowed to claim on their individual Schedule A. So this is information that the partner uses in preparation of their personal return. Then we move on to Section 3, which is the partner's distributive share of self-employment earnings. Generally, the profits from the business activity of the partnership that are reported on Line 22 of Form 1065 are subject to self-employment tax when they are passed through to the general partners or active LLC members. So on Line uh, 14A of Schedule K, you're going to enter the net earnings or loss from self-employment, but this is also going to include any guaranteed payments made to the partners. Preparers should make note of the following income items uh, or of how the following income items are treated for self-employment tax purposes though. A limited partner share of income is not self-employment income unless it is considered to be a guaranteed payment for services rendered to the partnership. Portfolio income and rental real estate income are generally not subject to self-employment tax unless obtained in the ordinary course of a business activity. Guaranteed payments that are shown on Form 1065 Line 10 and on Schedule K Line 4 are subject to FE tax. The portion of income reported on Line 22 of Form 1065 that is due to ordinary gain from Form 4797 is reported on Line 6 of Form 1065 and is not subject to FE tax. And the instructions for Form 1065 provide the following worksheet which can be used to determine the amount to enter on Line 14A. I've slapped it in here for you, but let's see how we would fill that form out for uh, DAX LLC. We're going to figure the amount of self-employment income that was earned by the active partners in DAX LLC is shown below. And remember, when we prepared page one of the 1065 for DAX LLC, we arrived at a net profit of $90,000. And that is the amount that is going to be carried here, ordinary business income or loss from Schedule K line one. There are actually no other addition amounts on here. We didn't have any guaranteed payments made to the partners. It's possible we could have, and if we had had a guaranteed payment, we would enter that amount on line 4A, but there were no guaranteed payments, so uh, it's 90000 all the way down. And that 90000 then will carry down to line 14A of the Schedule K. And then you can see it says non gross non-farm income. This is the gross receipts of DAX LLC prior to any expenses being claimed. That's the equivalent of what we entered on line 1 of the 1065, in this case 110000 Next up is the section for the partner's distributive share of credits. Net income of the partnership from line 22 of Form 1065 does not reflect adjustments for tax credits. If the business activity and expenses of the partnership or LLC are eligible for any tax credits, these credits are reported on lines 15A through 15F of the Schedule K. So let's just look at an example of a credit. If you have a restaurant activity where the servers are receiving tips, the tip income of the servers there is a credit that an employer can claim for the employer's share of tax paid on reported tips of an employee. And that credit is not claimable by the partnership. The partnership would actually have to reduce its expense deduction for payroll by any amount of credit claimed, but the credit claimed does not benefit the partnership because it can't claim a credit. It isn't taxed. So that credit is going to be put in the credit section of the Schedule K and then it will carry to the K-1 of the partners and the partners will individually claim any benefit from that credit. On lines 15A through 15D, enter credits relating to re rental real estate activities. On line 15E, enter credits related to rental activities other than rental real estate activities and use line 15F to report all other credits that are not includable on lines 15A through E. Identify the type of credit in the space provided if there is more than one type of credit or if there are any credits that are subject to recapture. Attach a statement to Form 1065 that separately identifies each type and amount of credit and the credit recapture information for each category. You can see the instructions for Form 1065 for a description of the available credits and their codes. And the next section then is foreign transactions, the partner's distributive share of foreign transactions. You're going to use line 16A through N if the partnership has foreign income deductions or losses or has paid or accrued foreign taxes. 
Then in Section 6, this section has to do with alternative minimum tax. Again, a partnership doesn't pay tax or alternative minimum tax, but it could be that certain income or expense items may have impact on calculations of alternative minimum tax at the partner level. And since net income of the 1065 may come from sources that have an impact under alternative minimum tax, this is the section of the form where you identify those items. And then uh, these items are reflected on the individual's return, and then the individual is going to make adjustments, typically on Form 6251 for alternative minimum tax computations. In Section 7, this is the partner's distributive share of other information. This section of the Schedule K is used to report tax-exempt interest income, non-deductible expenses, distributions, investment income, and expenses, and dividend distributions of the partnership. Next page, we're actually going to take the information for DAX LLC and prepare Schedule K for DAX LLC. We're continuing with the same information that we provided on the earlier pages, but in addition to that earlier information, I'm going to tell you that DAX LLC made a profit share distribution to its partners in the amount of $80,000. The partnership distribution went out equally with $40,000 each. So let's take a look at how this information is going to get reflected on Schedule K. We begin on line one by entering $90,000. This was the net ordinary business income from line 22 of the Form 1065. Remember that line 22 does not account for the $50 of interest, the $500 of meal and entertainment expense, $500 of charity, or that $10,000 Section 179 deduction. Then on line 5, 12, and 13, we enter the separately stated income and deduction items, including $50 of interest and $10,000 of Section 179 deduction and $500 of charitable contribution. Then on line 14A, $90,000 is entered as the net amount of income subject to self-employment tax. And line 14B is where we enter the gross non-farm income of DAX LLC. We then scoot all the way down to the bottom of the form, and in the other information section, we're going to enter $500 of non-deductible expense. That's the 50% of the non-deductible meal and entertainment expense. On line 19, we're going to enter that $80,000 of distribution that went out to the partners. And then on line 20, we're going to enter investment income of $50. Investment income of $50 is relevant to the partner. On the partner's return, they're going to report that as a form of investment income and ultimately can affect how much they are allowed to deduct on Schedule A as an invest expense by completing Form 4952. All right, then we move on to Form 1065, Page 5. Page 5 is probably the page that intimidates people the most. It's the most confusing part. And for that reason, small partnerships are actually not required to fill this form out. The whole point of that question six on the Schedule B is if you answer yes to all of the questions, you don't have to do page five. <laughs> but if you answer yes to any of the questions on uh, question six, then you have to do page five. And as you will see, I'm going to do page five for DAX LLC anyway because I personally find it is a, a way or a vehicle that I can use to make sure that I have not missed any income or deduction items for my client's return. And in fact, very often after completing the balance sheet or in the process of attempting to complete this balance sheet, I determine that the client has way underreported income or way overreported expenses or way underreported expenses, just nothing is balancing at all. And so I use this schedule to help me determine where my client's bookkeeping is falling short. And more often than not, their bookkeeping is really, really inadequate and therefore not accurate. So page 5 of Form 1065 is comprised of a section that is used to report an analysis of net income, loss, and as well, three separate schedules, including Schedule L, M1, and M2. And you can see I've broken the form up into these component parts. Part 1 is analysis of net income or loss. Part two is Schedule L, which is the balance sheet per books. Schedule M1 is a reconciliation of income or loss per company books with the profit or loss on the tax return. And in part four, we have Schedule M2, which is an analysis of the partner's capital accounts. So we're going to take each of these sections in turn again, beginning with part one, analysis of net income or loss. 
The analysis of net income or loss section of page 5 of Form 1065 is used to classify and allocate income of the partnership between general and limited partners and to identify income as either active or passive. How income is classified is going to affect the tax treatment that is given to each individual partner's share of income, loss, and deduction items that are shown on the Form 1065 return. On line 1, we combine the amounts that are shown on Schedule K, lines 1 through 11. We then subtract out the amount shown on lines 12 through 13D, also line 16L as well. Then on line 2, we have an analysis by partner type. We either have general partners or limited partners, and for each category of general or limited, we need to identify who that entity is. Is the general partner a corporation, an individual, and if that, it is an individual, is that individual active? If it is not an active individual, is it a passive individual, and so forth. So for line 2, for each type of partner shown, enter the portion of the amount shown on line 1 that was allocated to that type of partner. Foreign government partners are treated as corporate partners. You report all amounts for LLC members on the line for limited partners. That would be line 2B. The sum shown on line 2 must equal the amount shown on line 1. The, in addition, the amount on line 1 must equal the amount on line 9 of Schedule M1 if the partnership is required to file Schedule M1. And if the partnership files Schedule M3, the amount on line 1 must equal the amount in column D of line 26, part 2. Passive or active income or loss partners who are individuals must be classified as either active or passive. A partnership should classify each partner to the best of its knowledge and belief, and it is assumed that in most cases the level of a particular partner's participation in an activity will be apparent and obvious. However, if the following rules the following rules can be applied when classifying partners. If the partnership's principal activity is a trade or business, a general partner is classified as active if the partner materially participated in all partnership trade or business activities, and a general partner will be classified as passive if the partner did not materially participate in all partnership trade or business activities. If the interest is a working interest in a gas or oil well, classify a general partner as active, even if they are passive, because oil well activities are always considered active. Rental real estate activity. Classify a general partner as active if the partner actively participated in all of the partnership's rental real estate activities. Otherwise, classify a general partner as passive. For rental activity other than real estate, classify as passive all partners in a partnership whose principal activity is a rental activity other than a rental real estate activity. And portfolio activity. If the partnership's principal activity is portfolio income, classify the partners as active. You should classify as passive all limited partners in a partnership whose principal activity is, the tra is a trade or business or rental activity. And if the partnership cannot make a reasonable determination whether a partner's participation in a trade or business activity is material or whether a partner's participation in a rental real estate activity is active, you should classify that partner as passive. So the whole point of this section is a lot of rambling to get down to a very important bottom line. The bottom line is that the IRS wants to know whether a partner's distributive share of income or loss from an activity is active or passive because you cannot use passive activity losses to offset non-passive income. So this income or loss from a partnership is going to flow through to the individual return where other things are going on, and you cannot take a passive involvement in a particular partnership activity to offset, say, investment income or wage income that the partner has on their individual return. So this section is used to determine whether the income is passive or non-passive, active is the same as non-passive. And IRS never uses the word active, it uses the word non-passive. So it can be confusing when you're hearing it. So at any rate, let's take a look at the analysis of net income that we would prepare for DAX LLC. Kira and Jazia are active 50-50 partners in DAX LLC. And because DAX LLC is an LLC, they are automatically deemed to be limited partners. Also, we're going to be looking at the net income of the business, including how things were reported on Schedule K. So remember when we looked at the front page of 1065, we came up with a profit of 90000 Why isn't that number the number that's here? Because when we get to line one, we are going to factor in those other pass-through items, such as the charitable contributions, the interest income, 
but we are going to still disallow that 50% of meals and entertainment. So ultimately, the profit per books is 79050 and the profit per the return overall is 79550 And so 79550 is the amount entered on line one. And the amount entered on line one is going to need to equal another line that we're going to enter a little bit farther down the return. So you'll see how this line one is going to match up with another line on the return in just a minute. And then because they're an LLC, they're automatically deemed to be limited partners, but they both actively participate in their partnership. And so we're going to say that they're individual active, not individual passive. And again, how we arrive at this number that we've entered here, we take the $90,000 of income from page one, we add in the interest, we subtract out the section 179 deduction, and we subtract out the charitable contributions. Let's move on now to the Schedule L, which is the balance sheet per book. Schedule L is used to show the balance sheet of the partnership or LLC books. The balance sheet is divided into four separate columns showing beginning and ending balances for the year. And you should note that Schedule L is optional and does not need to be completed if you answered yes to all four of the following questions on line six of Schedule B that the partnership's total receipts were less than 250000 that the partnership assets were less than a million, that the K-1s were filed and issued to the partners on time, and the partnership is not filing and is not required to file Schedule M3. So let's take a look at the balance sheet for DAX LLC. We have a balance sheet as the, of the end of 2013, and we have another balance sheet for the end of 2014. And we're going to transfer these balance sheets, which are per company books, over to the Schedule L. And you can see that we have cash on hand at the end of the year was 11,000 for 2013, and by the end of 2014 it was 9,050. And we're going to show that the assets at the beginning of 2013 and the end of 2013, the assets were $20,000, the depreciable assets were 20, but they were fully depreciated. And for 2014, we added $10,000 of depreciable assets. We're claiming a Section 179 deduction on them, and so they are fully depreciated as well. We then show total assets for each of the, the end of 2013 and the end of 2014. We can see that at the end of 2013, there was a liability of $1,000 that's been cleaned off the books for 2014. And so we end up with total liabilities and capital at the end of 2013 that were 11000 and at the end of 2014 that were $9,050. Next step is to do the Schedule M1. And this is a reconciliation of income or loss per books with the income or loss per the return. Now, in most instances, the net income or loss of the partnership or LLC will be different than the net income per books. The difference comes from a variety of expense items that are not deductible by the partnership. Schedule M1 is used to explain these differences. And common items appearing or reported in this section include 50% of meals and entertainment as well as differences in depreciation. Frankly, Schedule M1 is where I usually find my mistakes. I've got the P&L that I'm working on from the, the partnership. And when I'm done with the partnership return, this Schedule M1 should balance. And if it doesn't balance, it's because I have an error somewhere. And this is where I find it. So a, uh, line one should equal the net income per books, and line nine should equal that analysis of net income or loss from the top of the form. So let's go back here. Right here, this is li this line one. That should equal line nine of schedule M1. And so ultimately, schedule M1, line nine, represents the profit or loss per the return. And line one represents the profit or loss per books. And the lines in between are used to explain or describe why they are different, because they would almost never be the same. Usually the profit per return is going to be different than the profit per books. And why is there a difference? We're going to use these lines to explain that. Let's look at an illustration here for DAX LLC. Income per DAX LLC books is $79,050, but the income per the tax return from line one of the analysis of net income is $79,550, and the $500 difference is attributable to the non-deductible meal and entertainment expense. And so we're going to show the profit per books of $79,050, we're going to show the profit per the return of $79,550, and the difference of $500 is explained right here on line 4B, travel and entertainment $500. Next we're going to move on to Schedule M2, which is the analysis of the partner's capital account. 
If question six has been answered no, then the partnership is required to complete Schedule M2. If the question is answered yes, you're not required to prepare it, but again, I prefer to do it. The amount shown on Schedule M2 should equal the total amounts reported on all of the partner Schedule K1s. The capital account is used to track partner's basis amounts in the partnership, or LLC, and basis in the partnership is increased by capital contributions and taxable net earnings of the partnership. Basis is reduced by distributions to partners and by deductible losses of the partnership. So let's take a look at how we would use this for Kira and Jadzia. We're showing on the balance sheet that they had an opening equity of $10,000. Their net income for the year was $79,050. They took distributions of $80,000 for the year, and their ending balance, as shown on the balance sheet, is $9,050 at the end of the year. So we're going to complete Schedule M2 for them as follows. The beginning of the year balance, $10,000. Net income per book, $79,050. We're going to add those lines up and we get $89,050. We then show distributions going out to the partners in the form of cash, and that leaves us with a year-end balance of $9,050. Cost of goods sold. Once we're finished preparing all of the other forms, where we actually have finished everything we can do for Jadzia and Kira in DAX LLC, but there is still some additional discussions to, to give you, and one of those is cost of goods sold. I haven't really put an illustration in here that involves cost of goods sold, but we should still talk about this form a little bit. Form 1125A replaces Schedule A, which was previously included on page 2 of Form 1120S and 1065 for years prior to 2011. In those earlier years, both Form 1065 and 1120S were actually four-page forms, and they increased the forms to be five pages so that they could actually include additional Schedule B questionnaire information, and then they took the COGS off and stuck it on its own form, Form 1125A. Businesses involved in the manufacture or sale of goods must generally keep track of inventory, purchases, labor, and other costs relating to cost of goods sold. Examples of businesses that should track COGS include restaurant and food service businesses, retail stores, wholesalers, and manufacturing businesses. COGS do not apply to certain service-oriented businesses, though. Cost of goods sold does not generally include supplies and materials that are used by service-oriented businesses like medical offices, lawyers, and accountants. Also, contractors who purchase materials to provide construction services and are not otherwise manufacturing a product or holding inventory for sale will generally not need to track COGS or complete Form 1125A. Generally, inventories are required at the beginning and end of each tax year if the production, purchase, or sale of merchandise is an income-producing factor. But certain small businesses are allowed to treat COGS as a supply expense. If a partnership is a qualifying taxpayer or a qualifying small business taxpayer, it may adopt or change its accounting method to account for inventory items in the same manner as materials and supplies that are not incidental. A qualifying small business taxpayer is a taxpayer that for each prior year ending on or after December 31 of 2000 has averaged annual gross receipts of $10 million or less for the three-year period ending with that prior year and whose principal business activity is not an ineligible activity. Under this accounting method, inventory costs for raw materials purchased for use in producing finished goods and merchandise purchased for resale are deductible in the year the finished goods or merchandise are sold, but not before the end of the year that the business paid for the raw materials or merchandise if it is also using the cash method. For additional guidance on this method of accounting for inventory items, you can refer to IRS Publication 538, Accounting Periods and Methods. Now let's take a look at Schedule K-1. We finished the 1065, including the Schedule K of the 1065, but we still need to take the information from the Schedule K of that 1065 and divide it between the partners. And we do that with Schedule K-1. Schedule K-1 is given to each partnership partner or LLC member, and information reported on Schedule K of Form 1065 flows through to each partner on his or her K-1. Income is divided according to each partner's share of income or loss items, and generally you must report partnership income items shown on Schedule K in the same way that the partnership treated the items on its return. And you can refer to the instructions for Schedule K-1 for certain exceptions to that general rule. Page 1 of Schedule K-1 is used to report each partner's share of the partnership's income, loss, deduction, and credit items. It also reports items that affect partnership basis, such as tax-exempt income, investment income and expenses, 
distributions of cash and other property, contributions of cash or other property, and non-deductible expenses. Page 2 of Schedule K-1 contains a summary of codes and descriptions which are used to interpret information that is reported on page 1, including where on the personal return each partner should report items shown on page 1. So let's look at the Schedule K-1. And, you know, even if you've not ever prepared a partnership return, you've probably seen lots of K-1s because your clients bring those in. And so understanding how to complete a Schedule K-1 can certainly help you determine how to take information from that K-1 and put it on the personal return. But we're not going to be using today's class to in any way talk about the personal return. We're using today's class to show how to prepare the Schedule K-1 for the partnership that the partnership will then issue to each partner. So we're going to take a look at Schedule K-1 for DAX LLC in just a minute. But you can see that the lines on the Schedule K-1 pretty much coincide with the lines appearing on Schedule K, but there's not a perfection of the reporting. In other words, there are some differences. In addition, you can see that there's space that is where we provide information about the partner. We describe the type of partner that we have, the partner's share of profit, loss, and capital, the partner's share of liabilities, whether those liabilities are recourse, non-recourse, qualified non-recourse. Also, the partner's capital account analysis, there's space for that. And then there are instructions or brief instruction codes for the Schedule K-1. And I'm not going to read these to you. Go nuts listening to me talk about them. But I have highlighted the ones that are relevant to today's illustration because these are the lines where we're going to be entering a code or a number relating to DAX LLC. You can see that we're going to be reporting an amount on line one, ordinary business income or loss. Also, that's going to be a non-passive form of income. We're going to show information relating to interest income. I didn't give them any guaranteed payments, but if they had a guaranteed payment, that would be on line four. Section 179 deduction and other deductions, such as the cash contribution, the self-employment earnings. Then we've got other non-deductible expenses. We also have line 19 distributions, and finally line 20 other information. So these are the lines or the codes that are really relevant to DAX LLC. And on the next page, I've got the completed K-1s for DAX LLC. This is a relatively simple division because I decided to make both these partners 50-50. So all of the numbers on the Schedule K are going to divide 50-50 between the partners. The Schedule K showed business income of $90,000. So the 50-50 split will be $45,000 each to Jadzia and to Kira. Then the $50 of interest income will be divided 50-50, $25 to each. We can see that the Section 179 deduction is $10,000. It's going to be divided 50-50 to each. The other deduction, which would be charitable contributions, is $500, and that will be divided 250 between each of them. Also, I told you that they took a distribution of $80,000 from the partnership, and I, I just explained that that was an even distribution. So each of them is going to show $40,000 as their respective share. The other part that's of interest is this part two, information about the partner. And we've entered the partner's identifying information. We should have an address in here as well. I've just simply described it as Jadzia or Kira, but you are supposed to enter their full name and address. And then we describe the type of partner this is. Jadzia is a general partner or LLC member manager. She is also a domestic partner. She is an individual. She was and is 50% ownership in profits, loss, and capital. And then we go down to the partner's capital account. This is going to correspond to information that was reported on Schedule L. And it should be that the sum totals of the K1s should coincide to the totals entered on Schedule L. And you can see right here, the ending capital account of the partner should equal the amount shown on line 9 of Schedule M2. And if we take Schedule M2 and show that it's $9,050, this is where we get 50-50 to each of them in this particular case. But there's no rule that says they're going to be 50-50 on their Schedule L on their K-1s. It just happens to be in this illustration that they are. That takes us to the next topic, which is adjusted basis in the partnership. A partnership interest is an item of property. And like any other form of property, it has a basis for tax purposes. A partner's basis in his or her partnership interest is referred to as outside basis. Initial basis in a partnership can be established in the following ways. Upon formation of the partnership, a partner's initial outside basis will generally equal the amount of money and the adjusted basis of property contributed. 
If the partner purchases his or her partnership interest, then the outside basis will equal the purchase price. A partnership interest may be acquired by means of an inheritance or a gift. Outside basis is made up of two components, tax capital accounts and the partner's share of partnership liabilities. Generally, the sum of the partner's outside basis will be equal to the partnership's inside basis in its asset. On a balance sheet, assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity, and in the partnership, assets equal liabilities plus the partnership's tax capital accounts. Inside basis. Although inside basis generally equals total outside basis, some distributions of property from the partnership or transfers of partnership interest can disrupt this equality, and by applying procedures provided for under Internal Revenue Code Section 754, the partnership can make upward or downward adjustments to the basis of its assets in order to restore normal equality in the balance sheet and thus recreate the equality between inside and outside total basis. Adjustments to basis, a partner must report his or her distributive share of partnership income in his or her taxable year in which or with which the partnership's taxable year ends. That may or may not be the same year in which he or she receives a distribution of cash or property. In other words, a partner must report his or her distributive share of partnership income regardless of whether that income is actually distributed. Now, as a general rule, when a partner tr transfers property to a partnership, gain or loss is not recognized. Additionally, a partner does not generally recognize gain or loss upon receiving distributions from a partnership unless the distribution is a cash distribution that is in excess of the partner's basis in his or her partnership interest, also called the outside basis. It is considered to be the responsibility of each partner to maintain records which show his or her basis in the partnership. However, the partnership also can track the partnership basis. And this is where things can get complicated for the tax preparer. Because if we're not preparing the partnership return, we don't know if the partnership has been accurately tracking that partner's basis. And the odds are that the partner doesn't know either. So there should be some discussion going on about the partnership basis, how a partner acquired an interest in a partnership. And you really need to be hearing from the partner that they contributing to taxable labor to the partnership for which they were paid, but the money stayed in the partnership. Then they wouldn't have been paid. But at any rate, they were given an interest in the partnership in exchange for their work. The partnership kept the money and gave them the interest, and then that would have been treated as payments to them. Those are things that would increase their basis. So a partner's basis is increased by the following items. The partner's additional contributions to the partnership, including an increased share or assumption of partnership liabilities. The partner's distributive share of taxable and non-taxable partnership income. The partner's distributive share of the excess of deductions for, or, uh, for depletion over the basis of the depletable property, unless the property is an oil or gas well whose basis has been allocated to the partners. And a partner's basis in the partnership will be decreased, but never below zero, by the following items. The money, including the decreased share of partnership liabilities or an assumption of the partner's individual liabilities by the partnership, and adjusted basis of property distributed to the partner by the partnership. The partner's distributive share of the partnership losses, including capital losses. The partner's distributive share of non-deductible partnership expenses that are not capital expenditures. This includes the partner's share of any Section 179 expenses, even if the partner cannot deduct the entire amount on his or her individual tax return. And finally, the partner's deduction for depletion of any partnership oil and gas wells up to the proportionate share of the adjusted basis of the wells that are allocated to that partner. Now, the IRS does provide a worksheet for figuring the adjusted basis of a partner's interest in the partnership, and there are some basis rules that I will leave you to uh, read on your own. But if you're trying to determine a partner's basis in a partnership, this worksheet is provided for helping you to do that. And then there are some rules and explanations on how to do the worksheet. And I've done a worksheet uh, for Jadzia and Kira, each of them. And we're going to determine the basis that each of them has in DAX LLC, as we see here. And you can see I've listed the name of the partner. And I begin by showing the, that partner's adjusted basis at the end of 2013. And for Kira, that was $5,000. Then on line 3 through 5, I show Kira's 50% share of amounts that are flowing through to her on Schedule K. Firstly, her share of the business income, her share of the portfolio income. We add those amounts to her opening basis, and we're left with $50,025. And 
We then subtract out distributions she received during the year of 40000 We also subtract out her 50% share of non-deductible expenses. And when we do that, we're left with $9,775. Then down near the bottom of line 10, we enter on line 10H, $250, which is her 50% share of the amount contributed to charity, as well as $5,000, which is her 50% share of the Section 179 deduction. These further reduce her basis in the partnership because they are going to be allowed as deductions or should be allowed as deductions on her return. And so they further reduce her basis in the partnership down to $4,525. We have a similar worksheet following all of the similar line of reasoning for Jadzia. And then down at the bottom, the software that we use, Drake Software, actually produces a reconciliation worksheet. And you just want to see that the amounts showing for each partner's basis actually equal the amount shown on the tax return. And then partnership portfolio income and rental income. We're really at the end of today's class, but I've got two, two additional items that I wanted to talk to you about briefly before we wrap it up. And I think with 10 minutes, we actually have enough time for that, which is good. On uh, portfolio income and rental income, as you recall, I told you that page one of forms 1120S and 1065, these are used to report income from the business activity of the S corporation or partnership. And in most in instances, the business activity will not include income from rental, real estate activities, or from portfolio income. Each of these items are treated and reported separately on the S corporation and partnership returns. So what is portfolio income? Well, generally, portfolio income includes all income other than income derived in the ordinary course of a trade or a business that is attributable to interest, dividends, royalties, income from a real estate investment trust, a regulated investment company, a real estate mortgage investment conduit, a common trust fund, a controlled foreign corporation, or a qualified electing fund or cooperative, or income from disposition of property that produces income of a type that is defined as portfolio income, and income from the disposition of property that is held for investment. So how do you report portfolio income? Well, you report portfolio income on Form 1065, page 4, Schedule K on lines 5 through 10. And on Form 1120S, you report it on page 2 of Schedule K, lines 4 through 9. Do not include portfolio income on page 1 of either Form 1065 or 1120S. If the corporation or partnership sold capital gain or lost property during the year, you should attach Schedule D and or Form 4797 as required. Net income from capital gains is not included in the ordinary income of the business and do not include capital gain income on page 1 of Form 1065 or 1120S. Reporting rental income and expenses of an LLC or S corporation. In most cases, rental income is a passive activity not included in ordinary income of the business. Rental income and expenses are therefore not reported on page one. Instead, follow these instructions to report rental income and expenses of a partnership or S corporation. In step one, you will attach form 8825 to the S corporation or partnership return to separately report income and deductible expenses from rental real estate activities and the net income or loss from rental real estate activities that flow through from partnerships, estates, or trusts. You will report net rental real estate income on Form 1065 or 1120S on Schedule K Line 2. Then in Step 2, you will report on Form 1065 or 1120S, Schedule K Line 3C, the net income or loss from rental activities other than those reported on Form 8825, and this includes the gain or loss from line 17 of form 4797 that is attributable to the sale, exchange, or involuntary conversion of an asset that was used in a rental activity other than a rental real estate activity, you would need to attach a statement. Passive activity loss rules. Passive activity loss rules apply to rental losses of S corporations and partnerships, and those shareholders or partners who actively participate in a rental real estate activity may be able to deduct part or all of their rental real estate losses and the deduction equivalent of rental real estate credits against income or tax from non-passive activities. Net income or loss from rental activities of an S corporation are reported on Form 1120S, Schedule K, Lines 2 through 3C, and net income or loss from rental activities of a partnership are reported on 1065, Schedule K, also on Lines 2 through 3C. Net income or loss from rental activities then flows through on a pro rata basis 
to form 1120F Schedule K1 or 1065 Schedule K1 and then on to each partner or shareholder. And generally, the combined amount of rental real estate losses and the deduction equivalent of rental real estate credits from all sources of each individual partner or shareholder are going to be subject to the rules affecting passive activity loss income. That is that passive activity losses must be offset by passive activity income, but in certain situations, individual partners and shareholders may be able to deduct up to 25,000 of rental real estate activities on their individual returns. And we get into passive activity loss limits in another course that I teach called At-Risk Limits and Passive Activity Loss Limits. I also have another course I teach on rental property. So those are the courses where I really talk about these passive activity loss rules. You can take those courses, you can read up on them on your own. But the bottom line is the reason that the IRS has you divide out and separately report rental real estate income is because that income is automatically deemed to be passive income or loss. And as such, it can only be used to offset other passive activity income or loss unless that partner is deemed to be an active participant in a rental real estate activities and their income is low enough that they qualify to deduct certain amounts with a maximum of 25000 per year. Now, if you are reporting rental real estate income, you're going to need to complete Form 8825. You can see it rising up here at the bottom of the screen. Net income or loss from Form 8825 is shown on line 2 of the Schedule K. You report credits related to rental real estate activities on line 15C and 15D of Schedule K. You report low-income housing credits on line 15D of Schedule K and K1 and on lines 13B, 13C, and 13D if the K-1 is for an S corporation rather than a partnership. So let's take a look at 8825. If you're thinking and you have an image in your head of Schedule E, which is used on individual returns, you'll recollect that Schedule E actually has room to enter three separate properties, but 8825 actually has room for eight properties. There are four on each of its two pages. So page one has room for four properties, and then page two has room for more properties. And then Form 8825, if you run out of space, you just keep adding additional forms. Now, there are some other rules to be aware of. The number of columns to be used for reporting income and expenses on this form can differ from the number of rental real estate activities the partnership or S corporation has for purposes of passive activity limitations. For example, a partnership owns two apartment buildings, and each is located in a different city. For purposes of passive activity limitations, the partnership grouped both buildings into a single activity. Although the partnership has only one rental real estate activity, for purposes of the passive activity limitations, it must report the income and deductions for each building in separate columns of Form 8825. You should see passive activity reporting requirements in the instructions for Form 1065, Form 1065B, or Form 1120S for more information. You should complete lines 1 through 17 for each property, but complete lines 18A through 21 only on one Form 8825, because these figures should be the combined totals for all of the forms. Do not report on Form 8825 any income or deductions from a trade or business activity or a rental activity other than a rental real estate activity because these items are reported elsewhere. Also do not report portfolio income or deductions, the Section 179 deduction, other items that must be reported separately to the partners or shareholders or commercial revitalization deductions. And finally, we're going to close out this lecture with a discussion of the grouping of activities when you are preparing a partnership return, you should be aware that you are allowed in certain situations to group activities, but only if the grouping of those activities does not in any way disguise or hide passive activities inside a non-passive activity or vice versa. So generally, one or more trader business activities or rental activities may be treated as a single activity if the activities make up an appropriate economic unit for measurement of gain or loss under the passive activity rules. Whether activities make up an appropriate economic unit depends on all of the relevant facts and circumstances. The factors given the greatest weight in determining whether activities make up an appropriate economic unit are the similarities and differences in the types of the trades or businesses, the extent of common control, the extent of common ownership, the geographical location, and the reliance between or among the activities. For example, Ken Forward LLC owns a hotel and a restaurant in Eugene, Oregon, and a hotel or, and restaurant in Vancouver, Washington. Ken Forward might group the business activities in any of the following ways. A single activity, 
a hotel activity and a restaurant activity, a Eugene activity and a Vancouver activity, or four separate activities. 10 Forward LLC can select any grouping that accurately reflects income and expenses of its business activities. Once it chooses a grouping, it must continue using that grouping in later tax years unless a material change in the facts and circumstances makes it clear that a change in grouping is appropriate. The IRS may regroup the corporation's activities if 10 Forward's grouping fails to reflect one or more appropriate economic units, and one of the primary purposes of the grouping is to avoid the passive activity limitations. The limitation on, there is a limitation on the grouping of certain activities, though. The following activities may never be grouped together. A rental activity with a trade or business activity, or an activity involving rental of real property with an activity involving the rental of personal property. And that's it for today's class. I'm going to put up the final password. I'm going to put a link in the chat box so that you can go take the password test, because you do need to take the password test. Now, as I'm signing off with you today, I did want to point out a classwork assignment. And this classwork assignment is going to be how we open the second part of this course. When we get into introduction to S corporations and LLCs part two, I'm going to open that session by completing this classwork assignment with you. So if you're going to be coming back for part two of this course, that is where we're going to do a review of this assignment. And the answer key for this assignment can be found inside the LMS, but you will learn more if you work your way through it. So I encourage you to use the time between this class and the next class to read through this classwork assignment and then prepare a tax return for Ben Foley LLC. Part two of this class is going to be all about the S Corporation return, but we are going to open up part two with a review of a 1065 return because that is the return that you're going to prepare for Ben Foley LLC as a part of this classwork assignment. And then after we've done the Ben Foley exercise, we're going to do a comparison of 1065 to 1120S, and then we're going to burrow into 1120S and do a whole bunch of illustrations of how to complete Form 1120S. All right. Thank you for participating in today's class, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Password number three is Android, A-N-D-R-O-I-D, Android. We hope you've enjoyed this tax education class. Pacific Northwest Tax School is approved as a CE provider by the IRS and the states of Oregon, New York, and Texas. We have been awarded the Quality Assurance Standard by NASBA and meet the CE requirements for CPAs in most U.S. states and territories. Tax clients demand knowledge and experience. Pacific Northwest Tax School provides the in-depth, practical education needed to improve your understanding of tax law and to meet the demands of the competitive tax preparation industry.